started. Okay, this meeting is now being recorded. Good. Okay. Um, good evening. I'm Bernie Vaness. I am chairman of the Hamilton Amateur Astronomers. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you on this beautiful Friday the 13th. Um, we have a pretty good crowd showing up. What's our count so far? We're sitting at 34. That's not too bad. I don't know what we have in Facebook. I'm not going to go find out. But uh, anyway, you're all welcome. Sit back, relax, enjoy this. Participate as you will. Uh, let's see, where are we going? Uh, we don't have a whole lot of uh, activity to... Uh, or sorry, uh, uh, business to discuss before we get underway. Um, we do have an issue, or not an issue, but uh, an item I'd like to bring to your attention and uh, a couple items. Number one would be being uh, or observing uh, opportunities at Binbrook are coming to uh, the forefront and we shall need, and we are looking for, people to volunteer to be key holders for that park. Now, being a key holder to that park, actually, it's not a key anymore. It's now a touch pad number thing, but we'll keep calling it a key holder. Um, the idea of being a, a key holder is not simply that you have a key that you can go out there anytime you choose and have at it. The, one of the responsibilities of being a key holder is that before you open the park, uh, or go into the park, you have to let the club members know that you are going and you are willing to facilitate them being there. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll put it all together in the form of a presentation and such uh, and uh, a learning session via Zoom at some point. Uh, might even do a, a live visit out there, whether it be cloudy, rainy or whatever, just so that you can get the lay of the land and know where things are and people are and such. If you're interested in that, uh, please drop me a line, drop me a note either in the comments or email me at chair or telephone me or text me or throw it with a string tied to a rock. I don't care. I just need to know that you might be interested in doing this. Um, let's see. The eclipse, 2024 eclipse is coming up pretty quick. That's all that's going to get closer faster. Uh, it'll seem like it'll accelerate. All of a sudden, it'll seem just like yesterday I was asking you about this, and I think I was actually. Um, some of you, let me know what you're planning, what you'd like, uh, if you'd like to help out in any type of an organization, old manner, to in any form with the eclipse where we're, we're right in the middle of it. Um, I know a lot of people are planning to go further south, whether that be just a couple of miles south or several thousands of miles south uh, to observe. That doesn't mean you can't help us out before the eclipse. And trust me, myself, uh, uh, my plan is I'll, I'll be happy to deal with the public till five minutes before the eclipse. And then five minutes after the eclipse, I'm all theirs again. But those 10 minutes or so during the uh, before and after the eclipse, that's my time. And I expect it to be everybody, every observer's time. So if, if you want to give a hand, let me know. You might even have you might even have some ideas as to what we might do as a group if we do anything at all as a group. Anyway, I'm babbling. So let's see, who do we have? Um, family Whitman. What is, what is our situation with the loners? How are we doing? Where are you? She's not talking. Bernie, now. can you give me one minute? <laughs> Hang on just a second. You caught me at a really bad moment. Hang on, I'll be right back. Okay, well, I'll keep talking then. Um, for those of you in the know, and for those of you who are not in the know, and new to the club, one of the great uh, advantages of our club is we have several good, uh, I was going to call them facilities, that's not quite the word, but we have very good uh, uh, attributes to the club. One being uh, our, our, donor, our commitment to the food bank, 
Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that at all since we're not face-to-face, -face, but I, I urge each of you to contribute to your local food banks when you have the chance, whether uh, monetarily or with food in kind, or even as a volunteer to help them out. Um, we also have our loaning program, our lenders program in the library. Uh, again, same issue, we have a uh, we do not have a physical library available to you at the moment unless you can arrange to pick up books uh, and return them as, as the case may be. Okay, and we have for newbies and uh, not newbies, we have a lending or telescope lending or equipment lending uh, option available to our members. And that's taken care of by the family Whitman. And I'm sorry, I just keep calling you, always calling you the family Whitman, but let us know oh. what you have. To be fair, it does say Fam Whitman on our profile. So it's it not does. a stretch. It does. And I've got a, today I've got a, a memory like a sieve. So if it says Fam Whitman, you're Fam. How you doing, Fam? We are. Fam is great. Uh, right now, everything is out. Um, but oh. if you're interested, that doesn't mean that you can't get anything. Let me know and I can put you on a waiting list. Uh, I, I will admit, and if anybody who has a scope right now is listening, um, most of the scopes are a little bit overdue to come back, but given the way the weather has been and now that suddenly the yeah. nice nights are coming out, I haven't been too on everybody, but um, it's picking up. So if you are interested, let me know. The uh, email is there, uh, lonerscope at astronomy.org. And... Uh, yeah, we'll get you a scope. Might not be right away, but we'll get you one. Awesome. Well, I, I well, it's it's good that we've run out of uh, uh, scope, and it's also bad that we've run out of scopes. But it's good that we have people checking them out. Uh, I know it's a double-edged people... sword. <laughs> yeah, double-edged sword. It's, uh, it's yeah. Um, it's good that people are getting experience with different types of telescopes and stuff. And, and you can tell that it's almost summer because it's been bright and clear during the week. And at night, it's been, yeah, it's been pretty good through the night. And the weekend's coming, and we've got cloud and rain and all that stuff in the forecast, of course. That's so. the problem. I, I just, I can't, I know, like I said, some of the scopes are overdue. I cannot bring myself to say, now that the nice skies are here, can you give us your scope back, please? Well, I, I, it, I, I suggest that we give everybody a three-week extension and, uh, and let, him, let them have that. Yeah. Um, one final note, and I'm sad to say, and uh, we, we are going to see the end of the presentations from Matthew at the end of our term this year. Matthew has decided and announced that he is not going to continue on uh, after, uh, after September, sorry, October, as our observing director. And uh, he's, he's been there a long time. He deserves a rest. Um, so we will be needing somebody soon to step forward and offer up their services or suggestions as to who might take that position. Um, I'm just putting that out there for now. If Again, same thing as before, or I said before, contact me in any which manner you can or any other member of the executive of this club. And let's see, what else? Mm, that's about it. I'll probably think of something later. Bernie, so have, pardon me? Just, just before you go, um, did you want Doug to talk about the calendar after the presentation? Sure. Okay. Sure. Why not? <laughs> we, we're, we're such a strict organization, right? Um, okay, so tonight we have uh, a great speaker. We've been having a good chat with him prior to the meeting. Uh, I was almost tempted when the, the, the recording started just to say, and here's Kareem and just let you keep on going. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Don't encourage me. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, absolutely. By all means. Um, Kareem Jaffer is a, a member of the RESC out of Montreal. Uh, I don't even have your bio sitting here in front of me, but he's a well-noted, well-decorated. He's an <laughs> author. He's a... 
uh, uh, professor. He's, he's a yacker like the rest of us. And as you can see, the telescope emerging from his neck, he's uh, up to his <laughs> ears in astronomy. Uh, I'll let him do the rest of his own introduction. Uh, enjoy the evening, folks. I know I'm going to. Thank you very much, Bernie. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. Hopefully, uh, at some point soon, we'll have that opportunity. Um, as Bernie mentioned, my name is Kareem Jaffer. I'm a professor here at John Abbott College. Uh, John Abbott College is a CEGEP, which in Montreal is basically the equivalent of grade 12 and first year university in Ontario. So I teach students who are, they have their basics from high school. Uh, they're learning their core material in sciences and physics, chemistry, math, and biology. But they're also exposed a little bit to interest areas, but in scientific courses. So I teach the astronomy course as a science option. So I teach it with hands-on activities, labs with modern astronomy and research projects as well. And that's one of the areas where I've been active in the RASC is with the pilot projects with the exoplanet transit with our remote telescope in California as well as with my students doing things like spectroscopy and bringing that into outreach, which is one of the things we do here in the Montreal Centre. What I'm going to talk to you about tonight is another avenue that has happened recently in the way in which I teach my astronomy course, but also some of the outreach that I've been doing across the world, really. Um, I've been active in outreach for years now. I'm part of the National Education and Public Outreach Committee on the RASC. But I also have taken on a few other hats. I'm a panelist on Astro Radio Reach Out and Touch Space show that's based out of the UK. It's a volunteer astronomy and music uh, radio station. And every Monday from 8 to 10 British summertime, which for us is about 3 to 5, we have a panel show where we just talk about current events in astronomy and we host guests who are doing research in different areas or have written books or are themselves outreach educators like us. I'm also one of the panelists and one of the presenters on the Tuesday Night Global Star Parties with Explore Alliance, and that's run by Explore Scientific and the Astronomical League down in the US. And so I ended up joining the uh, University Lowbrow Astronomers in Michigan uh, as part of my uh, decision to be a little bit more active in the Astronomical League. Uh, so wearing a few different hats here, but uh, my, my heart is always in Montreal. And part of the reason is because of the Rask Montreal Center. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about our center and some of the things that we do. And my thought was to start off with, let's just start off with a light pollution map so you know what we're in for when it comes to our skies in Montreal. Because this is kind of the way in which we talk to each other as observing astronomers, right? What are our skies like? What's our Bordel number? And if you ask me to put a Bordel number for my driveway, I'd probably guess right around, you know, 600 or so. Um, one of my friends constantly talks about the fact that he has Bordel 9000 skies in downtown Montreal. And the reason he says that is because if you look here, that's Montreal, that big light sink there. It's even bigger light sink than Toronto's whole area with Toronto, Mississauga, Hamilton, all the way to Niagara Falls. Montreal per capita is worse. We're actually the third worst in the entire world. Let's let that sink in for a bit. We're the only one in North America on the top five of that list. And the reason is a couple of fold. Part of it is the fact that we are contained on an island. And so a lot of the year we're surrounded by ice and snow. So the artificial light that we have in Montreal, it reflects massively. And so the entire Montreal becomes this dome of light, which you cannot escape from. Part of it is simply the lack of care that's been taken in a lot of the urban planning that's happened in the area. And I can point something out to you here. If you look here at the top right of the island, this whole area here, you can see an area where the artificial light seems dimmed a little bit. And that was actually a conscious effort by the Rosemont Borough to change all of the street lighting, to cap it, to change to lower emission LEDs at wavelengths that would cause less of an impact on the actual light pollution coming out of the city. So they did this incredible effort. They changed lights everywhere. And then there was three new companies that came into that area and a new hospital that was built, all of which didn't bother with any of those regulations. And so the light from that whole little block area is actually worse than it was before any of this started. Mm -hmm. 
So that doesn't bode well for the skies that we have in Montreal. Luckily, over here in the West Island, we actually have a protected area run by McGill University called the Morgan Arboretum. And that's where our RASC Montreal Center has our observatory. It's a 14 inch telescope. It's one that we've been putting a lot of effort into just before COVID, we got a new mount and everything. And so we cannot wait to start using this again. And just to the south of that, that little dark-ish area is where my campus is, John Abbott campus. So you can see that we actually have some reasonably okay skies for being still stuck on the island of Montreal. Now, the picture that you have there is from the 2017 partial solar eclipse. That was the first big event that we did at John Abbott campus involving the RASC Montreal Center. So when I joined RASC Montreal, I joined as a new educator who was taking over astronomy and who had no background in observation. And the club was so welcoming and so fantastic to me and my family that I thought we need to have a better partnership here between the students and the club so that they can benefit from amateur astronomy. Because one of the things I realized early on was some of my students will go on in space sciences. Some of them may even go on in astronomy and astrophysics, but the majority of them if they have an interest in space, it's going to come from the hobbyist side. It's going to come from the same side most of us come at this from, which is just enjoying the night sky and learning the tools of the trade. And so I wanted them exposed to the idea of amateur astronomy early on. And so we started these amazing partnerships where we would have the events for the public talks from Rask Montreal Center directly on our campus. We would have the students involved in our out in our nighttime observing, and then we host the astronomy library, the I.K. Williamson Library for the Montreal Center, including an entire section devoted to David Levy, who's our honorary president. And that became a really active area where students would be engaged and the members would be talking with them and then doing their own thing. They would share their research. The, we would do astrophotography, image processing together, all of that. And it's a really dynamic relationship. And if you want, at some point, I can come back and talk to you a little bit more about the actual inclusion of youth into our center and what that's done. But the part that I want to talk to you about today comes from this whole partnership, because when we started having these keynote events around the same time through the reconciliation process, we realized that we should be making statements of land acknowledgement whenever we start any of these larger scale events. And so we now incorporate these into our course outlines at the college, and I incorporate them into the start of every course. On the first day, I talked to them a little bit about land acknowledgement. But as I started to incorporate land acknowledgement into my outreach, I changed it into a land and sky acknowledgement. Because one of the things that we recognize <laughs> is the night sky that we see is not ours. It's shared across the globe and across time. And so when we look at the indigenous territories and the indigenous peoples, we have a lot to learn from them, from their legends and from the way in which they see the night sky. And so every event that I do now, I start off with this land and sky acknowledgement and I either talk about one of the legends of the constellations that's in the night sky and prominent at that time, or I talk about the moon for that month because our public events are typically right around the full moon. So right now we're just a couple of days away from the full moon. And for May, the Ojibwe call this the budding moon. And the reason they call it the budding moon is because it's the time when the medicinal flowers, the medicinal plants are finally providing their healing medicines back to the peoples of the Ojibwe nation. The Cree and the Mi'kmaq actually refer to it as the frog croaking moon because that's the sound that you hear. And when you look at pictures of a nice evening in spring, coming from the western coast or from the eastern coast from New Brunswick, for example. Paul Owen had this beautiful sunset picture on his Facebook page the other day, and I could swear I could hear the frogs croaking in the background. The Cherokee call it the planting moon, as do a lot of the European cultures. They call it the corn planting moon or the full flower moon or even the milk moon, because this is the time of year where you really have the heart of spring beginning. So when I started looking into this more and more, I thought the Mi'kmaq project, the Mi'kmaq Moons project that Dave Chapman led at the Ras Halifax Center was a great place to start incorporating a little bit more of the way in which the indigenous people see the natural connection to the moons that they see. So I talked to Dave a little bit about the story. And for those of you who aren't aware of this Mi'kmaq Moons project, it's a beautiful story. Uh, Kathy LeBlanc from the Acadia First Nation was working at Kajimakajik National Park, and I work really hard on that pronunciation because I have a lot of trouble with Kajimakajik, but she was working there and she was asked to do a night sky talk. And so she said, you know, by all means, I can talk about Muin and the seven hunter bird. 
I can talk about some of the legends that we have of the night sky, but I can't explain how to find these things or what they mean or what you're actually observing around them because I don't know the astronomy. So she reached out to the RASC Halifax Center and Dave Chapman was happy to go out with her and talk about the astronomy while she talked about the legends. And from that, they quickly realized that there was an importance to do both together because there's elements of observational astronomy in the legends tied directly in to the First Nation stories. And so when we talk about the Mi'kmaq Moons Project, what they did is they brought together the knowledge of the Mi'kmaq elders to understand the stories of the moons of the year. And those natural moons of the year are divided into roughly 12 different moons. And the current one again is frog croaking. And each moon relates to what's happening in nature at that time. And this is where some of the subtlety starts to come in. Because for example, we know that the lunar month does not fit evenly into the calendar year. You have more than 12. And so every couple of years, you have 13 full moons within that calendar year. So the way the Mi'kmaq acknowledge that is if they look in nature when a full moon is coming and they don't see the natural processes that are called for in the next moon, they simply repeat the previous name. And so frog croaking moon, if the first full moon was May 5th, on June 4th, the moon still comes out when the frogs are croaking. So they continue with frog croaking because the trees are not fully leafed yet either. And so you see this natural indication of the lunar cycle brought in. But there's more subtlety than that. And I'll give you an example. If you look at mm -hmm. December 6th to January 5th, that's referred to as the chief moon. Now it's referred to as the chief moon in our culture, in the Mi'kmaq, in December, right around winter solstice. And if you look at summer solstice for the Australian Aboriginals, they call it the spirit moon. So why would the Australians call the spirit moon in this, our summer solstice, their winter solstice, we call chief moon our winters. Oh, because winter time, the moon is much higher than the ecliptic because of our tilt, right? Because our tilt in the summer, we're facing closer to the sun or towards the sun. So the sun goes higher up in our sky. And so in the winter, since the sun is lower in the sky in shorter days, the moon is higher and it lasts for much, much more of the daytime or much, much more of the 24 hour cycle. And so the chief moon or the spirit moon are referred to because during those really, really long nights, the moon is really high up, it's bright, and it's shining down on us, and it's there to guide us throughout that entire dark, deep, cold night. And so the idea of the spirit or the chief or the, or the mm -hmm. some sort of a some sort of a, a metaphysical uh, uh, manifestation that's guiding over you during these darkest times of the year manifests itself in the way in which they refer to those moons. Now, the Mi'kmaq Moons Project wasn't alone. It began this entire series of projects, starting from the International Astronomy Year in 2009, to try to bring back the stories and reclaim the stories of the night sky by different First Nations. So for the Mi'kmaq Moons Project, I have a little clip here. And if you want to learn what the frog croaking moon, how to actually refer to it, because it's really hard for us from an English perspective or a French perspective to be able to pronounce these words. And the pronunciation, the names themselves carry so much meaning that they had the elders of the Mi'kmaq tribe give us those pronunciations and share them. Here we go, the frog croaking moon. Sculpt here we go. It comes from the Mi'kmaq word sculpt, which means frog. One of those words, it's when the animal says its own name, sculpt, sculpt. So sculpt you we goose, frog croaking moon. So those types of short videos just give you a little bit of an understanding as to the way in which those words carry their meaning and carry their power. And one of one of uh, one of the people who I've managed to meet through these different processes, Susan, she started this regeneration of Mi'kmaq star stories, and her grandmother tells the star stories in Mi'kmaq, and then Susan retells them in English with her daughter acting them out with her in short video clips. It's a beautiful setup, and so with that, we also had these books starting to be published that carried some of these legends with them that could be shared throughout the year. 
things like the circumpolar constellations, which you can share at any point in the year, now became codified and shared through illustration, through video, as well as through books. As I started to dive deeper and deeper into this idea of the First Nation stories, I started to realize that some of them are just beautiful stories in and of themselves. But when you start to dive in, you see actual astronomical observations tied in to the way in which these stories are told. And one of the ones that I wanted to share with you from the Ojibwe again is that of the Fisher. And the Fisher is how they refer to the Big Dipper or Moen and the Seven Hunter Birds. They refer to it as a Fisher. And the Fisher is an animal that uh, during the winter time, it becomes very, very starved, very, very thin. So the story goes that the Fisher was part of the winter animals and he was hungry and he realized that he really wished summer had come back. Now, a lot of the First Nations here in Canada refer to our world as Turtle Island. And Turtle Island is where we are now, but we come from another place. And in that other place, we have other sets of animals that we don't see all year round here on Turtle Island. So there's a portal to go back and forth is the way in which they describe it. So when Fisher brought these winter animals together, he said, where is summer? Why is summer not back? And the winter animals said, well, the summer animals are keeping are keeping summer on the on the on the wall of their cottage and they're holding it hostage because they're happy to have summer with them and leaving us to the cold in the winter and so fisher realized that they couldn't survive long if summer didn't come back so he offered to give himself up to go and get summer as long as the other winter animals could provide a distraction so the other winter animals provided a distraction Fisher. So Fisher climbed up into the sky to come back to Turtle Island, but of course he was hungry and weak. And so the summer animals caught him and they fired an arrow into him, killing him. So when they killed him, he's on his back and summer drops down onto Turtle Island and he saves the rest of the animals because he's brought summer back. And so now all of a sudden the, the, the world starts to heat up, it starts to brighten, the ice starts to melt, and life comes back to Turtle Island. So the creator saw fish and sunset throughout the year is because it's the story of Fisher providing the sacrifice. So why am I going through all this detail? Because if you look at the pictures, if you look at the petroglyphs, if you look at the bark paintings of Fisher by the Ojibwe, the arrow that's shot by the summer animals always hits at the exact same spot, the visible double star on the tail, Alcor and Mizar. And if you talk to the actual elders of the Ojibwe, they say, well, of course, that's where the arrow hits because you can see that the star has been split in two. So within the legend, mm -hmm. within the story, you have the actual astronomical observation of that double star system. Now, that's not a true double star system, right? That's a visual double star because Alcor and Mazar are both at very, very different distances. But the fact that that visual double star is where that arrow hits just got me. And so I started to try to understand more about what's called two-eyed seeing. And that's this idea that with one eye, you look at the indigenous stories and with the other eye, you look at modern scientific knowledge and you see from both eyes to for the benefit of all to bring together what the, what the indigenous stories are trying to tell us about the astronomy that was being viewed by the indigenous and ancient peoples. So the one that I tell my students all the time, which is one that unfortunately at this point, I can't talk about all the different legends because it's no longer up in the night sky, it's Orion, it's the winter maker. For the Ojibwe, the winter maker was their constellation that when it was up early on in the, just before sunrise, when you started to see uh, winter maker come up, you knew that summer was kind of starting to end. But when winter maker came up, just after sunset, winter was here and snow was there. You would see snow at any point from that moment onwards. And so for me, I actually have a neighbor 
across the road, where as soon as I see Orion above his house, when I go out at night to just either pop up and see the moon or to go for a walk after dinner, if I see Orion come up above that house, I know my garage has to be empty for my wife's car to go in there because the snow's going to hit. And then she has to take the kids in the morning to the bus stop. So, you know, I need to make sure. So I use winter maker myself. What's interesting about the indigenous peoples is most of their stories were passed down from generation to generation, either by song or by oral tradition. Very few of them were written down in any way until recently. So the stories, they encompass more than just the astronomical observations and the connection to nature. They also serve as moral, ethical, and practical guides. And so when we look at a lot of these stories, when we look at a lot of these legends, we see astronomy, we see nature, but we also see the way in which they approached the world and other animals who they depended on for sustenance. So over the next little bit, I'm gonna walk you through a few of these different examples from not just here in Canada, from all across the world. And so if at any point you have questions, you want to ask me anything, um, unmute and I will pause and I can stop sharing so that we can chat. Uh, or if you want to leave your questions to the end, that's fine as well. But I want to share with you a few of these different ones. And I want to do it in the light of something that we have to understand and appreciate when we're sharing these Indigenous stories. And I learned this during COVID times because NASA put together this beautiful series of presentations on two-eyed seeing from different cultures. And the Dakota Lakota and the Navajo Diné astronomy sessions were incredible. And when I was talking to the elders in those sessions, one of the things they mentioned is not every story can be told at every time of the year. And that's one of the reasons why they hesitate to record their stories, to write them down, because the stories have to be contextual to the time of the year in which you want to talk about them. So I talk about Wintermaker because that's one of the constellations that they do write down in the Ojibwe. They do share out loud. But when I talk about Orion or Wintermaker or whatever you want to refer to it as, I cannot share the Dakota Lakota version of it or the Navajo Diné version of it because right now Orion isn't visible for us at sunset. It's not visible before sunrise. It's currently hidden from us. And so if it's hidden from us, we can't talk about it. It's the same thing with some of the Milky Way stories, where during the winter time we can't talk about the Milky Way stories from the Chinese culture or the Milky Way stories from the Australian culture, because they're not meant to be shared when that part of the arm of the Milky Way isn't prominent in the night sky at that time. And so for the Navajo Dine, one of the things that they do is they have this wonderful kit of materials that they've created for schools in the U.S. And you can apply and get copies of these if you're a teacher in any school anywhere in the world, provided you are willing to acknowledge that you will not tell certain stories at certain times and that you will not give these stories an unauthentic voice. And now this is where I have to give a caveat. I'm not an authentic voice for most of the stories that I'm sharing with you. I've tried to learn from as many authentic voices as I can, but I will never be able to capture the beauty or the essence or the subtlety of these stories. I can only try to capture the main elements and share enough with you that hopefully you'll go to authentic voices to learn from them. So at a few points, I'm going to share with you where you can get certain authentic voices. And one of those is actually through NASA Science, because NASA Science now has these curated packages of material for the U.S. First Nations, for the Cherokee, for the Cree, for the Sioux, and for the Navajo Diné. So when I talk to you about the fisher and I talk to you about Moen and the seven hunter birds, what I was talking to you about was one of the big circumpolar constellations that we look at, the Big Dipper. And I try to stick to the circumpolar constellations for the start of this deep dive into two-eyed seeing because they're ones that we can talk about all year round. And the reason we can talk about them all year round is because if you didn't have the sun come up, you'd actually see them above the horizon all year long. And that's what's beautiful about these. And you use them as signposts as well. You know, you can catch your beautiful star trails and see where the Little Dipper is, where the Big Dipper is. And then you can use the Big Dipper for star hopping. Right? I talk to my students about arcing to Arcturus, and I talk to them about cutting across the bowl to the twins of Gemini. And we chat about this and we learn how to use these signposts as we go through the night sky. 
the ancients did the same thing. And so in order to remember which stars led to which other constellations, which directions, their stories became richer and deeper and they took on more meaning because then the poetry of the stories leads you through that star hopping. And that's one of the beauties of the constellation myths. So when we look at the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, when we were in school, and I'm sure many of you saw this as I did as a kid, we only ever learned about either the Greek or the Roman myths for this. But even from the Greeks and the Roman myths, we can learn a lot about the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. So for example, for the Romans, for the Romans, Jupiter, or Zeus for the Greek, he was in love with Callisto, who was a fair, fair maiden. And his wife, Hera, Juno for the Romans, was incredibly jealous. So for the Roman myth, Juno turns Callisto into a bear so that she can no longer benefit from her beauty. Her beauty is now hidden. However, Zeus has already, or Jupiter has already had a bastard son with Callisto. His name was Arcus and he was a hunter. And so in a real fit of jealousy, Juno left Callisto as a bear on the mountain where Arcus was hunting. And Arcus saw this beautiful big bear and he shot it with his arrow. And as this bear was dying, it turned into his mother. And Arcus let out a cry of despair. And Jupiter realized quickly what had happened because he knew his wife Juno's rage and her incredible hatred of all of his bastard sons. And so what Jupiter did is he took Callisto and Arcus and turned them both into bears and threw them up into the heavens so that they would be safe from Juno's rage. So Juno was a petty person. So she went up to Neptune, the god of the sea, and she said, do you see those two bears? They are filthy with their deceit and with their evil, well, forbidden love of Jupiter. And so I want you to ensure that those two bears will never bathe. They'll never be able to wash their filth off. I want them to never touch the ocean. And of course, Poseidon immediately said, yes, you know, or Neptune, sorry, it's uh, the Roman myth. Uh, so Neptune said, absolutely, you know, you're, you're my sister, I will make sure of this. And so that's why the two bears never get to touch the ocean. They never set, they never get to dive into the sea and refresh themselves. Now, that's the Roman story. In the Greek story, Zeus is having a illicit meetup with Callisto when he hears Hera coming by. And so what he quickly does is he changes Callisto into a bear so that Hera doesn't know that he was there with another woman. And then he greets Hera and he goes off to walk with her, not realizing that Arcus, Callisto's son, was hunting in the same woods. And so the same type of thing happens. Arcus hits the bear. The bear turns back into Callisto. Arcus cries out in, in sorrow. Zeus realizes what's happened and behind Hera's back, tosses them both up into the sky, changing them into bears. But he can't stand the thought of losing them, so he keeps them in his view all the time, which is why they never set, because that's his love and her son. So it's interesting to note that the Roman culture, the woman has power. And that was actually what we saw in Roman culture all along the colonial times. Whereas in Greek culture, the women were more of a trophy and to be, to be listened to, but the men were the ones who had the power. And you can see in the Greek story that Zeus was the one who did all of the actual action. Hera did none. She simply, he knew that she would be upset and she would be angry. And so he hid it from her as best as he could. So we learn a little bit about the cultures and their stories as well. The other thing that we note is that the picture of the bears isn't always consistent. Sometimes the bears have longer tails. Sometimes the bears have shorter tails, depending on which part of the bear is the bowl in which part of the bear is the tail of the dippers. This is also accounted for by the stories where they talk about when Zeus threw them up into the sky to keep them safe, or when in that case, Jupiter threw them up into the skies to keep them safe from Juno, that he grabbed them by the tails and swung them around so that he could get them really high up into the sky and that lengthened their tails because bears normally don't have tails of that size. Now, other cultures look up at these stars and they don't see bears. We see bears because we're used to bears and we know bears are the animals that can rise up on their hind legs. So when we see the position of the dipper change, 
And we see that at some points, the dipper is actually up on its hind legs. A bear makes sense to us in our legends. But for the Scandinavians, this was actually a wain. It was a, it was a, a funeral procession being led by horses. And that was the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper Ursa Minor. They both kind of rotated around together. And this was caught in, this was captured in poetry and in literature of the time. Sir Walter Scott talked about the Northern Bear and Arthur's Wayne. And for the Europeans, they often referred to it as Charles Wayne and Ladies Wayne, where the smaller one was the women's wagon and the larger one was the men's wagon. And for the Arabs, it was actually three mourners following after a casket. These legends, these stories, all try to encompass a little bit of the way in which the culture sees the death or the rotation, the, the, the repeating, the cycle of the stars and the cycle of the sky. Now, as I mentioned, I do want to talk a little bit about Orion because it's a beautiful example for a couple of other reasons. But Orion is also one of the most recognizable constellations outside of the circumpolar constellations. So when we talk about Orion and we talk about Orion's belt and we talk about all these beautiful things, we refer to Orion as the hunter and the son of Poseidon because that's the way we learn about it typically from the Greek. The Chinese referred to him as General Sao and he was the protector of all the farmers, because the farmers were the ones who were out reaping the harvest or planting the fields at different times when Orion was close to the horizon. And when they're pulling their harvest close to the horizon in the fall, they have to really be protected from other nearby villages. But when they're planting in the wintertime, they actually have to be protected from wildlife because wildlife is hungry after a very long winter at times. And so General Sa, the protector, was there. And for the Indians, it was Vishnu. It was the Hindu god. And sometimes he had a bow and arrow. Sometimes he had an axe. Sometimes he even had a sword. But we're going to come back to Vishnu and his axe, which is why I wanted to just seed that here. But the one I want to talk to you about isn't from North America, isn't from the Northern Hemisphere. It's from the Southern Hemisphere, and it's called Jilpan. And Jilpin is from the Yonglu people in the northern territories of Australia. And Jilpin is this three young men who had caught a fish, and they caught the fish, but it was a sawfish, and sawfish were sacred to their village. But they were hungry, and so they caught the fish and they ate it. And when the village elders realized what these children had done, they banished the children up into the night sky. Now, this is the story, and if we turn it around a little bit, maybe we can see kind of the similarities between this direction of Jopin and the way in which we see Orion here in the Northern Hemisphere. Of course, it's upside down in the Southern Hemisphere. But the question arises, why this story? What does this story have to do with anything with nature? I mean, they caught a fish and they ate it. What was wrong with that? Now, it's impossible for us to say at this point how much the elders of the Yonglu people knew about sawfish. But if you've ever learned about sawfish, they are actually bottom feeders. They scavenge along the bottom of the coast close to the shore. And as they do so, they kick up the waste and they recycle the waste and they pull all of these little minerals and all these little animals and they end up coming up into the water which brings larger seafood, larger fish closer to the shore because the sawfish provides for them a lot of food. It also recycles a lot of the nature right along the coast which keeps that entire coastal area from becoming uh, fermented, becoming, becoming stagnant. And so sawfish were instrumental for the biosphere right there close to the shoreline and brought in larger fish which would actually feed the entire village. So their reason for not allowing sawfish to be eaten was because they were too vital to the ecosystem and to the way in which that village survived. So these two, these three youth that had eaten the sawfish and been banished up into the sky served as a story to tell the young people of the village that they cannot eat sawfish because it's too vital, because they will be punished for it, and that punishment will be so severe that they'll never be able to come back to their village. So there's a beauty in this, but there's also an incredible amount of 
actual understanding of the way in which the ecosystem depended on one specific type of fish. And that's just wonderful to see. Now, that same Orion is actually referred to in Swana in South Africa as three dogs in the belt or in the sword chasing three warthogs on the belt. And the reason for that is because you don't want the dogs to catch the warthogs when Orion is in the sky. So you shouldn't hunt warthogs, you shouldn't catch warthogs while Orion is prominent in the sky. Because when Orion is prominent in the sky is when warthogs have their litters. And their litters are typically litters of three. So you see those three stars in the sky, you know not to go and hunt warthogs. You can chase them, but you should not catch them. Because if they have their litters, then now you have warthogs to catch next year. If you catch them when they're still pregnant, now all of a sudden the warthog population has gone down dramatically. So again, it's this recognition that there's stories that they associate with a lot of these constellations. They have a deeper meaning to the way in which those villages survive. But I mentioned that there's a lot of actual astronomy directly within these stories. And so staying there close to Australia, we can go to the Murray Island people in Torres Strait, and these Merriam people have this beautiful song called the Twinkling Stars Song. And what the Twinkling Stars Song refers to is the idea that you have a calm night with no clouds, but the stars up above are twinkling. Now, I often like talking about the Pleiades at this time as well, because the Andes Mountains, they have an incredible amount of literature on what happens when the Pleiades are twinkling and what happens when the Pleiades are clear. But of course, the Pleiades have set. So we can't talk about the Pleiades themselves. But when the Murray Island people, the Marian people are talking about this, they're not talking about any specific stars. They're just talking about the stars up above twinkling when the sky is calm. And what they're talking about is scintillation. Because when you have scintillation, you have the Earth's atmosphere moving around, causing the light from the star to bounce around back and forth. Now, if it's calm and it's clear, how can you have light twinkling and going, why is the seeing bad? And the seeing is bad because you have incredible pockets of cold and warm air in the upper atmosphere. And that happens when monsoon season is coming because those pressure differentials bring in those incredible rains. So scintillation is actually the harbinger of monsoon season. And monsoon season is necessary because it takes the land from brown to lush and green. And so you have yams that are the only thing that can grow when you have brown land, but yams, if they get flooded, they go rancid. So you have to harvest the yams the minute you see that scintillation and prepare the garden for new plantings. And as soon as the monsoons are passed, you can plant every other type of crop because now you have enough sustenance and enough water in the soil to grow these other crops. So they carry this in their bark paintings and in their stories and in their songs. And they use that to understand this little bit of atmospheric observation. And we see this with atmospheric observation all the time. You talk about those 22 degree halos that we see around the sun and the moon or the sun dogs that sometimes appear at 22 degrees to either side when the halo has actually crystallized into these small formations of additional points of light at 22 degrees away from our sun and our moon. Now these we now know are caused by these hexagonally flat ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. But in early, like I'm talking early, Aristotle times, they were observing these mock suns, these sun dogs, which is what they're called in Scandinavia. And they're observing them following always to the side without knowing why they're there. And I mean, in the War of the Roses in 1461, they actually convinced the troops that it was the three sons of the Duke of York come to battle with them. But what I find really amazing is in Newfoundland in 1843, when it was still a British colony, they have note of the winter of the three suns, where day after day after day, the sun rose with sun dogs. And during that time, it was treacherous and it was icy and it was incredibly cold for 15 straight days. And this is written into literature that if the sun dogs appear for multiple days at a time, be prepared for icy conditions. And so there's a sense of connection between observations that are made and what's going on in nature, even with atmospheric conditions like these. 
Now, these observations don't just go with the stars, they also go with the planets. And things like retrograde motion of Mars is something that's been known to our First Nations from early on. And uh, um, uh, Wilfer Buck, he actually refers to this as retrograde motion as moose spirit or moose wa aka. And that's because when a moose is startled, right, it runs in a big, huge circle to see what startled it. And if it doesn't see anything, then it just continues on its way. And so they talk about the fact that Mars and Jupiter, those bright stars that are actually not stars but wanderers, they get possessed by the moose spirit during each of their bi-yearly passages. And for Mars, they actually have it written as bi-yearly because Mars, of course, passes by in opposition every two years. So you see retrograde motion happen in the same location in the sky at around the same time every couple of years. In Arnhem, north of Australia, we go back down south, the morning star Venus was observed as a morning star as well as an evening star. Now, when I would teach about Venus to my students, you know, I would talk about the fact that the Babylonians had recognized that there was a morning star and an evening star that never appeared at the same time, and that likely this was the same object going back and forth from morning to evening. But it turns out that this is in a lot of cultures. A lot of cultures recognized Venus, and they recognized that Venus never strayed too far from the horizon. And so the Island of the Dead on Braglu, they pictured Venus as this morning star that would lead out in the evening sometimes. The, it would lead back the, the fisher boats, and in the morning it would allow them to leave because the coral reefs were incredibly dangerous and they needed light to be able to guide their way out. And so when there was no moon, their only choice was the morning star. And so they'd ask the morning star to come out and lead their way, but she was afraid of drowning. And so two elder women tied a rope to her to prevent her from drowning as she led the boats out as far into sea as she could. And so that's why Venus never goes too high above the horizon. It's because these elder women are there to pull her back in when she's done her task. Now, these types of things we catch on on wood bark paintings. We hear them in stories. They're handed down from generation to generation like the moose spirit from Wilfred Buck most recently. But what about those cultures that are gone before they have a chance to share their stories? Or what about those cultures that don't leave behind any written word or any art, but they do leave behind petroglyphs or rocks? And we talk about archaeoastronomy. We talk about these observations of stone collections that have some sort of a meaning to them of the actual relationship to the sky, whether it's where sun is at summer solstice and winter solstice, whether it's where certain constellations are at different times, or whether like Stonehenge, it's a giant burial ground that also happens to have some incredible astronomical, almost coincidences, but perhaps that's what they were built into for that burial ground. So when you see a collection of rocks in a circle, it's really, really, you know, encouraging to say, oh, look, it's, it's archaeoastronomy, but it's not always. And some of you may remember that about uh, 10 years ago, there was a series of underwater stones found in Lake Michigan. And they thought, oh, my God, it's a North American Stonehenge. And they reported this idea of North American Stonehenge. And they looked at these rocks. And as they studied the rocks and they found more and more of them under Lake Michigan, they realized that the actual orientation of the rocks was not a circle. And it didn't seem to have anything to do with the way in which the sky operates as we know it. And so what do you do when you come across something like this? Well, you go to all the First Nations along the Great Lakes and you ask for their stories of stone structures. And as we did that, and as we walked through, we found a selection of Cree uh, stories, and those Cree stories had to do with the idea of a hunting ground. And this was brilliant because what they did is they lined up rocks with specific arrangements so that on one side, the, the herdsmen could actually push a caribou tribe to go stampeding down one side of these rocks. And on the other side of the rocks, they had their best hunters with the bow and arrow. And they would pick off the weakest of the caribou. And then at the end, there would be a rock curve, which is why they thought at first that there was an actual circle of rocks, but that rock curve would lead the caribou to a new grazing ground, give the old grazing ground a chance to revive, 
pick off the weakest of the caribou to feed the tribe for the winter time. And the caribou now had a new grazing ground where they could shelter for the winter. And the next year they'd be ready for another set of, of hunt and to sustain this village for longer. And so this was captured in their stories that they had these beautiful rock formations where they had their sacred hunting ground for right before winter time. And that's what was actually found underwater in Lake Michigan. Now, when we see these types of archaeoastronomical um, ruins, and I mean, that's what we have to say, ruins, but, um, you know, sometimes they're pristine, like the Noth Passage tomb and the Newgrange Passage tomb. And sometimes in the act of trying to understand them, we destroy them. And that's the case of the Douth Passage tomb in Ireland where they were trying to go into the passage tomb to see what was inside. And of course, if there's any treasures to try to take them, but when they detonated it, it collapsed inwards. And the only thing they were able to take out was one of the passage stones. And that passage stone has on it depictions of solar eclipses, what we believe to be solar eclipses. One of our local Montreal members, Robin Edgar, has actually written a series of articles about the Doth Passage tomb um, uh, entryway stone. And it's incredible how wonderfully accurate some of these depictions are to the way in which the, these specific solar eclipses were seen in Chinese or other, uh, or not Chinese, sorry, in, uh, in uh, Averbury, in other locations where they depicted similar solar eclipses at around the same time. But there you still have people living nearby to ask and to try to generate and get stories from literature. Chanquillo in Peru is one of those complexes where there's nobody left to tell the story. And Chanquillo is one where there's a couple of solar observatories. There's some incredibly intricate work within the rock walls of this complex. And it's one of those that we don't fully understand yet. And so archeologists are still trying to piece together the, the original locations of some of the objects within those complexes to try to get a better idea of how many different things this community, this culture was able to actually ascertain because there's no written evidence and there's no idea of who these people were in Chanquillo. However, there's these beautiful sawtooth rocks on a hillside. And if you stand at one of these solar observatories and you look at these sawtooth rocks, on the very left to the very right is the entire encompassment of the, the rising point of the sun from June solstice all the way through to December solstice with the equinox spaced perfectly in the middle. Now, I'm not saying space perfectly in the middle angularly, because that's not the case. It's spaced perfectly in the middle in terms of the number of teeth that you have to go down to get to the equinox from the June solstice all the way through to the December solstice. So there's actually 13 different gaps, including the one to the left and the one to the right. And the centermost gap is the equinox. And we can see the same type of behavior of where the sun rises from furthest north to furthest south for us in the northern hemisphere, going from summer to winter. And in the southern hemisphere, it would be the exact opposite. And we can see that by doing these beautiful solography pictures like this one that I did for my campus. And you can see that not only does the sun reach different altitudes at different times of the year, but the point where it starts to rise moves further and further north for us here in the northern hemisphere as the year moves on. So these types of identifications were built in to Chanquillo hey. complex. Hello? Sure. Was that a question? Sorry, I can't hear. No, it was background noise. Oh, okay. I just, no problem. I just muted. It's okay. No worries. So I, I wanted to point this out because this I just saw about a week ago is Dave Chapman in another beautiful uh, acknowledgement of these wonderful two eyed seeing um, applications is part of this sky pillar project in the Mi'kmaq moons uh, area, but this is in one of the Mi'kmaq parks. And so this is a pillar that faces directly north to south. So at your local solar noon, the sun has a different altitude throughout the year. 
And so if you look through the gap, you can see that there's rocks placed at different intervals. And so you actually have from winter solstice all the way out to summer solstice and then back these specific steps that tell you which time of the year you're at and then correlates those to the Mi'kmaq moons for that time of year. It's a beautiful little example of using something as complex as this Jankio setup, but in a very refined geometry, just looking at the meridian rather than trying to look at the sunrise moment. Chaco Canyon is another one that is just incredibly fascinating. Chaco Canyon is in New Mexico, and the peoples of Chaco Canyon don't exist anymore. And when you look at the local other tribes, they all refer to the people of Chaco Canyon, something similar to the Anasazi. And Anasazi in the Navajo term means enemy people. So whoever these people were, were wiped out by the other local tribes. And so the other local tribes took turns actually living in Chaco Canyon at different times since those people, the Chacoans, were wiped out. So the civilization in Chaco Canyon was at its height in the 11th century. Now in the 11th century, we had some incredible astronomical events. And where I first learned about Chaco Canyon was this observation of the supernova 1054 AD, which is the Crab Nebula. And you can see the phase of the moon, where Venus was, and where the Crab Nebula was. And at that time on July, or actually this one would have been, I believe, March in uh, 1054, I believe it was March in 1054, that's right, no, it was July in, in 1054, that's where you would have seen that supernova according to the view from Chaco Canyon. So the supernova would have been exactly to the east or to the west where the Venus was right after sunset, and that supernova was dominant enough to be caught not just by the the Anasazi but also in China it was noted in the silk in the silk uh, comet comet uh, atlas uh, Maguadi. Now on the floor of that you see this beautiful structure here. Now this structure here was painted around the same time and we're not 100% sure what that was. For a while there people thought it was actually another eclipse that was being envisioned. But when we think back to the early 11th century on July 11th, 1097, there was a solar eclipse in that region. But that solar eclipse didn't have that shape of corona where it was only one-sided. However, in 1066, Halley's Comet would have been visible and it would have been incredibly bright at that time. And so we now believe this is actually a depiction of Halley's Comet. And of course, we just passed through the tail of Halley's Comet with the Eta Aquarids just last week. So we can see observations of not just supernovae, but also something like what we believe is one of the comets that would have been visible at that time. But here's where it gets really interesting in Chaco Canyon, because they have a solar observatory area where you have this beautiful spiral with a sun dagger that passes through the center of that spiral exactly at the summer solstice. Now at the summer solstice, you have this beautiful dagger come right through the center of the innermost large spiral. Spring equinox and fall equinox, you have it to one side of the spiral, and you have a second dagger going through a tiny smaller, smaller spiral. And winter solstice, you have two of these sun daggers coming straight through either side. Now this comes from this beautiful arrangement of rocks where the sun shines through in just the right orientation. So I wanted to tell you how these sun daggers are formed. So bear with me here. At the summer solstice, just past 11 o'clock local solar time, a small spot of sunlight first appears above the center of the large spiral. The dagger grows for about 15 minutes until it bisects the spiral over almost its entire height. And then the sun is high enough that the upper end of the dagger gets cut off. And for the next Five minutes or so, the whole dagger moves down the spiral so that after a total of 20 minutes, the dagger is now gone. So just over those 20 minutes, you see this dagger go through the center spiral, grow in size, shift, and then disappear. In winter sequence, a similar type of thing happens, but two daggers form on either side of the spiral. And then the equinox daggers appear along the same way 
but you get two daggers, one small and one large. In order for this to happen, you have to have two beautifully curved stones above these two gaps that are perfectly placed so that the dagger actually appears for just that brief moment of time and makes that motion before it disappears. So the amount of precision that was involved in creating this solar calendar was incredible. So when we first realized this and people started going and studying it, unfortunately, because the ground was still shifting and a lot of it was eroded, one of these rocks actually tipped inward. And so this whole feature no longer appears. But as soon as that rock shifted inwards and they realized how unstable this whole canyon is, the whole canyon was roped off and became protected territory, which is actually, I think, a good thing. Um, but one of the really interesting things here, and I have yet to look into this too deeply, but the larger spiral is exactly the size where the full moon rising Okay, the full moon rising at different times of the year creates a shadow at different points along that spiral that repeats every 18.6 years. And 18.6 years is roughly the syzygy required for the moon to go back through the moon-sun-earth arrangement to repeat back to almost the exact same locations. So it appears that the large spiral not only helped to indicate where the sun was and where the earth was in its orbit around the sun, as we now know, but it also helped to indicate how far along the lunar cycle we were for the lunar orbit and its movement with respect to our orbit around the sun. Then when you look at Chaco Canyon even more deeply, you start to see these beautiful petroglyphs, including this one here that I've circled, that appears to be the solar eclipse that I talked to you about in 1097. And the reason why we believe that's the same one is because in Peru, we have a similar depiction of that solar eclipse where it would have been visible in northern Peru as well as in southern New Mexico along its path of totality. And you can see this incredible curved aspect to the corona because that would have been right at the heart of the solar maximum 11 years during one of the larger maximum, according to our models of what the sun would have been like back in the early 11th century. So in Chaco Canyon, in this archaeoastronomical complex, we have supernovae detections, we have solar calendars, we have lunar calendars, we have comets, and we have solar eclipses. And we have no one to tell us how well they, how they figured out how to denote all this, let alone create this mathematical complex for the 11, for the 18.6 years for the full moon. Now, if I'm going to talk about eclipses, given that we have a lunar eclipse coming up in a couple of days, I figure it's important for us to mention that in ancient astronomy, predicting and documenting eclipses was, well, it was something that was a given. I mean, any emperor had to be able to say, what was going to happen to the sun and the moon if they were worth their salt, right? So one of the tales from 2159 BC was of two court astrologers in China, Ho and He, and Ho and He mispredicted when an eclipse would happen. And so because they got it wrong, they were slain on the spot because it was the sort of thing that most emperors, most rulers of the day would use to actually strike fear into the hearts of the people. Because imagine you can make the sun disappear for a few minutes, or imagine you can make the moon disappear and then come back blood red because it's angry. And so lunar eclipses were actually regarded as evil omens because you had the moon, this bright, beautiful white object, disappear. And then all of a sudden there was bright red and staring at you. And so unless you did certain sacrifices, unless the rulers were able to appease the gods, that lunar eclipse would have been there to stay. And so they were able to predict when these lunar eclipses happened because they had the same cycle as solar eclipses. Your syzygy over those 18 plus years was predicted by Babylonian astronomers. And in Mayan astronomy, they actually always showed lunar eclipses and solar eclipses side by side because they knew that if one happened, the other one would be visible somewhere else. And so we know now that we do always see those happen in pairs. 
The stories of these lunar and solar eclipses tell us a lot about the way in which they were seen by different uh, cultures. So the Vikings, Hadi and Skoll, were the two wolves, the sons of Fenrir, that would chase after the moon and the sun. And they were trying to catch the moon and the sun to cause Armageddon because they were the ones who were going to bring about the end of the world. But if they ever caught them, the sun was incredibly hot and the moon was thought to be frigidly cold. They couldn't keep them in their mouths, which meant that they would spit them back out. But if they spit them back out, their purpose is not fulfilled. So then they go chasing after them again. And so the idea of Hattie and Skull chasing after the sun and the moon was one thing. But it turns out that if you read the stories a bit more carefully, Hattie and Skull are both given both genders, as are the moon and the sun. And so sometimes it's Hattie chasing after the sun, and sometimes it's Hattie chasing after the moon. And same thing with Skull. And so some of the legends talk about the idea that Skull would catch the moon, but it would freeze his mouth, so he'd spit it out. But he wouldn't give up so easily, so he'd catch the moon again, but it was too cold, so he'd spit it out. And so he'd realize that he'd be better off chasing the sun, so he and so Hattie and Skull would switch. And that kind of explains why sometimes you have multiple lunar eclipses in the same year, and then you won't have any in that visible for that area of the world for a couple of years, and then again you'll see a couple in a row. That whole mythology captures that, that essence. The demon Rahu, this is one of my favorite ones from the Hindu culture. So the idea here was Vishnu was holding a banquet for the sun and the moon gods to make them immortal. So he fed them some of the immortal nectar and the demon Rahu realized what was happening and felt jealous and so he wanted to be immortal too. So he disguised himself and came to the feast. And so as the sun and the moon god dropped down their, their beautiful immortal nectar, they realized that the other person at the feast wasn't a god, it was the demon Rahu. So they told Vishnu, they said the demon is going to take the immortal nectar. So Vishnu got angry and pulled out that axe of his and swung. But as he swung, Rahu took a quaff of the immortal nectar. So Rahu was beheaded, but not before he had taken his quaff of immortality. So now there was a disembodied head of a demon that was immortal and was angry at the sun and the moon gods for preventing him from actually becoming immortal the same as they were. So now Rahu chases the moon and the sun all the time. And if he catches them, he swallows them because he is so angry at them. But because he's only a head, as soon as he swallows them, they come straight out the bottom. And so that's why solar and lunar eclipses never last for very long. The solar bark of Ra, we saw that beautifully during the annular eclipse last year. June, when the sun was just rising as it was already in its eclipse, and you could see the beautiful solar bark. And that's also believed to be part of the orientation of the bull and the cow uh, for, the, for the Egyptians, uh, for the uh, hieroglyphs that you see in a lot of the pyramids. Now, here locally, we actually have a wonderful set of tales, especially the Innu tales, and Laurie Rousseau-Nepton from the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, who's an Innu and a astrophysicist from here at the University of Montreal, last summer she shared with us a couple of the Innu stories. And they were wonderful to hear firsthand the legends of the First Nations when it came to the eclipses. And a lot of them were along the same lines as the ones that I've told you, where it's the idea of something trying to either capture the moon and the sun, or swallow the moon and the sun, or hunt the moon and the sun. And one of the really interesting things about this was when we decided to do this project with her with the RASC and Discover the Universe and uh, the Dunlop Institute in Toronto, when we reached out to her, she agreed, but she asked for it to be translated into multiple languages. So it was translated into Innu, it was translated into Mi'kmaq, it was translated into Cree, it was translated into French, and it was translated into Hawaiian uh, because she wanted it to have as large of a reach as possible. And I absolutely adore that she that she that she decided to do that, that she decided to go, you know, one step beyond. So I'm actually going to end with this one and then I'm, uh, there was more that I that I have, but I'm going to I'm going to end with this one because this is one of our Milky Way ones, which you can tell all year round because the Milky Way in the southern hemisphere is, of course, prominent throughout the year. And this is the legend of Pripragi or Pripragu. Uh, 
uh, depending on which part of Queensland you look at and what uh, what pronunciation and what transliteration you read. But he was a famous, famous hunter there in the in the plains. And he was accomplished as a hunter, accomplished as a singer, accomplished as a dancer. Now, he knew all the songs for his village, and so he led the village in song every night. He knew all the dances for the village, and he led the village in dances every night. And he knew all the tricks to hunting, so he hunted, and he hunted to feed the entire village. And so they were really dependent on Pre Priggy, but Pre Priggy was growing bored. And so one morning when he woke up early, he decided he wanted a treat. So he went traipsing off through the forest and he found an entire gathering of flying fox sleeping in a tree. Now flying fox are these winged bats and they're apparently a delicacy. Now, I've never had them myself, but if you have, you know, you can let me know if they're as good as they're, they seem worth it for pre -bringy. But he decided that if he's going to have a delicacy, he's going to have the best of the delicacies because he's the best hunter in the world. And so he decided to kill the chieftain of the flying foxes. So while it was asleep, he snuck up, he took his bow and arrow, and he killed it. And its death cries woke the entire tree of flying foxes. And when they realized that the chieftain had been slain, they grabbed Pre Priggy and they pulled him up into the sky. And Pre Priggy was lost. So now the villagers woke up, and there's no Pre Priggy. And so they were hungry, but they didn't know what to do. So they went out and they tried to capture something. One of them caught a snake, one of them caught a rabbit, and then they came back and that was it. And then they thought, well, you know, we're hungry, so we can't do anything about that. Let's sing some songs that'll take our mind off of it. But none of them could remember the tunes. So they tried to dance to at least bring a little bit of joy to the kids, but they couldn't remember the steps. And so they became very desolate and very, very sad. And then they started to hear music coming from the sky. And they looked up and they saw the stars start to move around and take shape to follow the music and to follow the lines of dancing that Pre Priggy had taught them. And they realized that Pre Priggy was leading the stars to dance, to share with them one last time the dancing and the songs of the Australian wilderness. And so when they look up at the night sky and they see that arm of the Milky Way, it's twofold. One, it reminds them of their culture and their stories and their dance. But secondly, it reminds them to not be over, overwrought, over arrogant, overstep themselves, and to remember that the village comes first, that your own personal goals, your own personal search has to come second to the welfare of the, of the village itself. So when you're out there in the night sky and you're watching the arm of the Milky Way this summer and you're seeing the occasional shooting star, keep in mind that the stories of these stars and the stories of these legends all have in them an incredible amount of astronomy and science. And so on behalf of myself and the elders who've allowed me to share their knowledge, I want to thank you, Hamilton, for allowing me to talk to you a little bit about two-eyed seeing. Remember to use both eyes for the benefit of all. And over here on the left, I actually have this beautiful painting from the Haida Gawaii that I just loved because it talked to me about the aurora. And so what I want to end with is the aurora during the full moon was something that I was always told is not really that special because the full moon kind of, you know, it, it takes away from the majesty of the aurora. Well, lo and behold, January 15, 16 from Finland, this picture was shared with me of the aurora with the full moon rising below it. So what you hear in the stories of the First Nations in their art and in their legends really does match the observations that we can make ourselves as astronomers. Thank you. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of questions. There have to be questions after that. Um, I will say while, while you're either typing them in or uh, to, for Sue to transfer to us, I will say that uh, you and I, Kareem, are both members of the Astronomical League. Um, and the Astronomical League, as you know, and I'll let our, our viewers know, uh, has a program called Alternate Constellations. Yep which is a program that I've been working on since they released it a couple of, uh, two years ago. Oh, excellent. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very challenging. It's very good. Uh, for those who don't know about it, uh, it's 
uh, you're, you're given a list of, I don't know what there are, there are 30 or so, something like that. Uh, I think they're up to 36 now. Two parts, yeah. now. Done in two parts. Uh, they, they, you have to research and find where these ancient constellations are and then observe them and, and sketch them out and such. Uh, quite challenging, quite educational, a great way to spend a, a rainy evening. Uh, and if you have the Stellarium uh, application downloaded on your computer, the, the full version of Stellarium actually allows you to take a lot of the First Nations and other culture constellations and pull them out. Yes. So you can see Jolpin, you can see um, the Odin's Wayne, you can see the Wintermaker, and you can see which stars are in Wintermaker but not in Orion and vice versa. Right. And, and how some of the, uh, it's, it's great because it shows you how some constellations actually came to being, uh, it's particularly the southern one, which was, uh, I forget, Argo or something like that, and, yep. and became five or six different constellations. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see any of them from here, but uh, just the, the history of how it happened is, is very good. Um, okay, so Sue, do we have any interesting uh, questions or? <laughs> any um, there questions? are there are no there are no questions in the the I've chat at this point in time. I, I just heard someone say I've got a question. Yeah, yeah, Daniel from Oakville. Uh, you're touching on something that uh, I was I was actually going to ask you about. How how is it that that uh, that the constellation you refer to Wintermaker? and Orion, how is it that, that that native groups chose the same collection of stars yeah. to to collect to form their constellation Wintermaker is say the, the I don't know the Persians or some group of people thousands of years ago chose that group of stars how is this how does this I'm brand new to this by the way I don't have any idea oh no worries Daniel it's a really good question and it's one that I actually have my students explore and the way I have them explore it is I show them uh, a picture of Orion with Betelgeuse highlighted. Then I show them for 24 different cultures, which shape Betelgeuse is in a constellation for them. And half of them, it's very similar to the Hunter Orion. Half of them, it's incredibly similar. The other half, it's, you know, just the arm. Some of them, it's actually uh, Betelgeuse all the way out to Pollux and Castor. And they're combined together. In one, it's Betelgeuse, Rigel, and then up to the Pleiades and Aldebaran, and then back as almost like a, a winter triangle of sorts, but slightly skewed. I think it's called the winter arrowhead or something like that. But one of the one of the reasons why we pick out the constellations the way we do is simply based on brightness. Is if you go out to a dark sky and you see how many incredible stars you can see, I mean. Teske did a plot at one point, and he plotted 5,700 stars by hand uh, over the span of multiple nights, because that's what he could see with his eyes in a dark sky. We can't possibly orient ourselves with that many. But if you look at just the brightest of them that come out during the early twilight hours, those are the ones that you use. And oh, those ones are commonly seen throughout the world, because during those early twilight hours, it's only the ones of magnitude uh, up to about magnitude one that you can see. I Anything see. past one, you're not going to see until it gets to darker skies. And so these clusters are naturally collected based upon their brightness in the early evening sky. Right. And one group might call it uh, Orion and another group might call it uh, Wintermaker. Exactly. And Wintermaker by the Ojibwe, right next to them, the Cree of the Plains would actually refer to it as three Inuit with a canoe chasing after a polar bear. And so <laughs> you have the same set of stars, but visually they see a different shape. And that's the pareidolia. And that's, that's kind of like where when you look at the man on the moon, we see a man, other people see the rabbit, some people see Wilma Flintstone. And it's a case of how the shadows speak to your eyes and match with things that you're familiar with. And that's where I, I especially like with the Big Dipper, the fact that so many cultures refer to it as a bear because bears are the only thing we see that go up on their hind legs all the time. And so when the Big Dipper is moving up in that direction, what shape would you associate with something that can go vertical 
but an animal that could also go vertical. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. And one thing that I want to point out is uh, I'm always up for learning more. If you have stories of stars that you want to share, I, I don't want to hog the spotlight. I'd love to hear more. Um, so I, this is actually where the, the Arab mourners, where I first heard of it was one of my students was saying, well, you know, do you think it's the British that brought the idea of the mourners to the Arabs or do you think it was vice versa? I was like, I have no idea. And I'm going to look, I have yet to find a concrete reason why those two vastly separate cultures geographically both looked at the Big Dipper as a coffin with mourners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do know Odin's Wayne was referred to by the Scandinavians because Odin originally wasn't just the god of gods, but he was also the one who took all the regular souls up to up to Valhalla, basically, where they would work in Valhalla. They weren't they weren't heroes, so they didn't get to sit there and quaff beers with everybody else, but they were the ones who worked around Valhalla because they had led an okay life on the ground. So then the god of gods would take them all in one big wagon up to the sky. Bernie, at this point in time, I don't see anything. Comments about it being a captivating and extremely interesting presentation. So Bernie, the floor is all yours. Awesome. Okay, well, I will take this floor and I believe Doug has a very quick couple of minutes for us uh, regarding our uh, annual calendar. Um, Kareem, thank you very, very much. You're yes. welcome to stick around. Yep. Uh, right, after Doug, right after Doug has his <laughs> little uh, spiel that he has for us, uh, we'll go into a, a five to eight minute break. And that's a, usually just a social gathering whilst people go get coffee and stretch for a bit. Uh, after that, we come back and we have four prizes that we give away. And then we have Matthew Mannering come on and do his uh, Sky This Month presentation. That's fantastic. I do have a call coming up in a bit, but I'll stay for a little while. Okay, good. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, Doug, if you're Hi. all set. Hi, Bernie. I just wanted to let you know this is going to be about 15 minutes rather than five. So if you want to postpone it until after or another night, that's fine. But I'm ready to go. Uh, you just let me know about the timing. Okay, well, what we'll do then is we'll take the break now. We'll come back to you, and then we'll do the, the door prizes and continue on. Sounds good. I need a bit of a stretch. And I, feel, I feel a few people do as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll take, we'll take a couple of minutes, come back at 5 after by my clock. I've got 8.59 right now. So we'll see you in six minutes, folks. Talk amongst yourself. It's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Kareem, uh, that Kijimakujik Park in Nova Scotia, are you saying there's something there now? So uh, right outside the park in one of the public areas, they've built this sky pillar. And that sky pillar now allows you at solar noon to see how far along the, uh, along the altitude the sun has reached by seeing how far the shadow of the sky pillar goes. But they do still have um, two-eyed seeing talks a couple of times every summer where they have both somebody from the First Nations as well as somebody from the local astronomy clubs together doing presentations. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. There's also a couple of other parks there where they're trying to bring that in. Um, I believe one in New Brunswick, they're trying to bring that in, but it hasn't, I don't think it's been set up yet, but the hope is, is once, you know, the Acadia First Nations has seen how wonderfully this this promotes some of the work and some of the some of the, even some of the art that their that their members do, right? That uh, they they it brings it brings some positivity into the into the cultural view. Um, I know up north when they do the Aurora three hundred and sixty, they have an entire night hosted by the First Nations where they tell the stories of the auroras, and uh, that includes the drumming circle, that includes the young kids playing, that includes the the actual uh, dances that they teach that are the auroral dances. So there, there's a lot more of this happening now, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, the last time I was there was in the 90s in Kijimakujik, and uh, 
late nineties, mid nineties. And uh, they didn't have anything like no. that. No, back then, no, this is very recent. This, I believe it started in 2016 or 2017. Okay. And Do you know uh, how often the Aurora 360 happens? It was twice a year pre COVID. That's what they had upped it to. And I know, uh, I know Ken is looking at starting it up again come fall. Okay. Put that on my list. To, yeah, I can reach out to Pierre Paquette and as soon as he tells me that it's happening, I'll let you know. Oh, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. But uh, Bob, I was going to say that um, the oh, uh, Wilford Buck actually holds campfire nights uh, in Manitoba where he shares the stories and he teaches some of the other youth in the Cree Nation to tell the stories as well. And so he talks about grandmother spider and there's a lot of these stories where he can't share the stories other than in the heart of the summer. That's the only time where you can really talk about some of these stories where the Milky Way is so prominent that you can talk about the wormhole as they call it and things like that. Okay. Friend of mine, uh, his son is the executive officer on HMCS, Harry DeWolf, who just went through the Northern Passage, did the circumnavigation of North America. And he has some tremendous pictures from the North and the lights. Yeah, I, I, one of the nice things about COVID time is people are sharing their views. And so a couple of times in class, you know, I would turn on a view from Finland while the students were working on a, an assignment or on a lab. And I just have the Northern lights going up on the board and I'd be sitting there just kind of staring at it. They're like, sir, what's going on? I'm like. You guys are occupied. I'm just enjoying myself. <laughs> what I want to hear, I want to hear the auroral noise. I want to hear that 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 crackling that they say that you can hear of the ionosphere actually having that interaction with the gases. Right? Where the ionization happens, you can hear apparently a little bit of crackling when the auroral curtain gets low enough. I'd I'll love to you experience know. that. I'll tell you all about it if I experience it. <laughs> I thought you were going to offer to like smuggle me in your luggage or something. Oh yeah. gosh. Well, I was thinking, oh, wouldn't it be great to take a telescope, but how do you take a telescope on a boat? You know? <laughs> oh, uh, take a spotting scope, like, like just, a, or a, bino a good, good yeah, binoculars. Yeah, I'm taking my binoculars. Yeah. 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 Hmm. yeah. No, um, I, when it comes to being on a boat and trying to observe anything uh, with, yeah. with any long duration, it's impossible. I know. <laughs> I actually have my students every year. I have them look up the story of uh, of um, um, uh, what's his name, Le Gentil, uh, uh, Felix de Le Gentil. He's the one who went out from France to do the Venus transit observation, and missed the first one because of the war and everything, and then ended up deciding to stay and build an entire observatory in India and got up there and then it was rainy the second time, eight years later. So then he made his way back, but they'd already declared him dead because none of his correspondence had ever reached. And his wife had remarried and his family had destroyed all of his, all of his like holdings and everything. And so I just, I'm like, you know, Guillaume Le Gentil is your story of what it was like to be a scientist in the old days. Be happy that all you have to do is log on to Google and look for That's stuff. That's true, that's so true. <laughs> well, if, if I know Joanne at all, uh, <laughs> She probably, you know, when, when she's getting on the boat with her telescope, it'll be a, a statement of, Captain, I think we're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> yeah. It'll be fun. The question is, how many cameras and how many backup batteries are you taking? Well, that's a thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Even for that. Sunday, I was sitting there, I, I got myself an intervalometer, I was going to get it all set up and, and like, make sure it's all working, but uh, forecast is not very good for Sunday. And uh, I'm just hoping to get one good image if the clouds part and I manage to catch that just that sucker hole and just get that one little image of totality, that would be, I'd be happy. Well, I hope you do. I hope you get it. Uh, the forecast for here is, is not that great. Uh, well, there's only hoping. And, and one of the nice things about uh, the internet is we're, we'll be able to watch it from somewhere. So we actually have, uh, so I've, I've connected with the virtual telescope project in Italy and uh, the last couple of events I've been sharing with them pictures live when we have clear skies.
but they get them from people from all over the world who have views of the event. And then our global star party with Explore Scientific is going to be live during the entire lunar eclipse so that people who have views can share them with everybody else. Are, are so you, I'll put I'll put the link for both of them in the chat. Are you a, a, a member of the Astronomers with a, Without Borders? I'm not. Uh, our <laughs> Astronomers Without Borders here in uh, Montreal is actually where the headquarters were for a while, and uh, um, Andrew Fazakis, our former public events coordinator, was their big the night sky guy. He was the one who ran a lot of the Astronomers Without Borders stuff with his wife Zoe. And then they both kind of stopped and the office and everything moved afar. But while they were doing it, because of his previous association with RASC Montreal, they asked for us not to be involved because they wanted to make sure Astronomers Without Borders was his brand and not RASC Montreal. So at the moment, now that he's been away from it for a while, I want to get back to it. I want to kind of restart that relationship. But at the time, just just they didn't want to confuse people as to what he was representing when he did programs. Okay, cool. It's a good organization. And for those members who are not familiar with it, look them up, Google them, find out what's going on with them, give them your support as absolutely you see fit. Anyway, once again, thank you. Uh, My pleasure. You didn't, get, you didn't get much of a break. <laughs> no worries, no worries. I will have to leave in about 10 minutes or so, so I'll say okay. thank you for having me from now but uh thank you we'll be in touch uh, especially i i think we'll uh call on you to give us a talk on spectroscopy at some point sure that'd be fun yeah i know there's a couple of members that would be interested in that right michael yeah absolutely <laughs> cream that cream that was that was a wonderful uh presentation uh, thank you thank you uh, michael okay so um, Doug, I'm here. What are you now? Okay, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you will all be able to see it. Uh, there we go. Oh. There you go. Okay, so F5. Okay, uh, Council has asked me to talk a little bit about some of the technical guidelines that I've provided for the images that are going to be presented in the um, upcoming calendar. So that's why I'm showing you this slides. One of the first things that I thought I should clear up, um, it's been a long time since I've done a presentation like this. So bear with me, I'm going to make mistakes. Um, the other thing that I wanted to make clear is that many of you will probably know all of this information already, um, but there are people who don't. So again, bear with us so that we can get everyone up to the same speed. <clears throat> Now, one of the things that I talked about in my letter about the uh, pictures was the file type. Now, file type simply refers to the organization of data in the computer file that you send. Um, you know the file type by the extension, the three letters that are at the end of the file type. I'm going to ask, or I have asked, if you would send TIFF files if possible. The main reason for that is that TIFF is technically superior. I was just told that you're not seeing my full screen. So if you can, uh, do you see any of it? Well, we're, we're seeing your your uh, uh, presentation view, or not your presentation view, the other one. Which, what other? But, but you're okay, we can see it. We can oh. see it. Okay. It's just your file, uh, your presentation type. That's okay, go back to it. We're seeing it in edit mode. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, thank, you. thank you, Matthew. I couldn't remember what it was called. How's that? Uh, you just got to give us a minute till it shows up. There you go. All right, that's good. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I was talking about file types. Uh, basically, I'm asking if it's possible for you to send a TIFF file because TIFF files are technically superior than some of the other uh, files that you can send. And the main reason is that TIFF retains all of its original data. I also mentioned in my, my uh, send out, uh, now my screen's not advancing. Oh, there we go. I also mentioned in my send out uh, PSD files, which is basically the same as TIFF, but they're Adobe specific. So if you have Photoshop or Lightroom, you can get TIFF files. Many of you might be familiar with JPEG. Uh, JPEG files are eight bits. Um, 
that's not that big of a deal. But the real problem with JPEGs is that every time you save a JPEG file, it recompresses the file. So it increases the degradation that you see in the file. Now, I've done a diagram here. This is a, a deliberately created image that it will emphasize the difference between the different types of files. Now, this <clears throat> is a TIFF image, and it comes in at six and a half megabytes. The same image as a JPEG comes in at one point, sorry, at 198 kilobytes. You have to ask yourself, where did all that other information go? This is the first save. Save it a second time, and you may be able to start to see some of the horizontal and vertical um, lines. They're called artifacts, but what's happening is the data is being recompressed and recompressed. You save it a third time and you get even more expression in your image and you can see that the file size has gone, gone down a little bit. <clears throat> the basic thing here is to try and send a file that's as reasonably error-free as possible. Now, the other thing I mentioned in the message was that the file size. Basically here, anything that's over two gigabytes is except, or under two gigabytes is fine. Um, my computer gets a little bit bogged down when I start dealing with files that are over two gig. The real problem is that my internet service provider will not uh, accept emails that have attachments that are in excess of 24 megabytes in total. So if you have a collection of files or even one, <clears throat> which is entirely possible, uh, we need to send it in by a file transfer service, such as WeTransfer. Now, orientation. Um, there's landscape, which basically means it's wider than tall, and it's approximately the same shape as a calendar page. I can't do anything to change the shape of the calendar page. So if you send me a portrait image, which is taller than it is wide, and I try and stick that portrait image into my landscape a page, I'm going to have parts of the page showing with nothing printed on it. Now, I've got a choice. I can leave it white or I can leave it black or change it to some other color, but it doesn't really fit. There's a couple of ways of dealing with these landscape portrait images. I could rotate it, I'll just turn it 90 degrees. And for a lot of astro images, that's fine because there is no terrestrial elements to the astro image. But if your image has, say, a tree or a house or someone standing in it because you're at a star party, um, when I rotate it 90 degrees, it would put that person three house on the side and that would not look quite right. So the other option here is to crop the image, which means I chop some of it off. And as you can see, you lose a big part of the image. Now, if I don't like cropping and it doesn't work out well, I can scale the image. Now, scaling means that I reduce it in all dimensions proportionally. So it becomes the same image, but it's smaller. And as you can see, we still have a lot of white space or black space left the sides of the image. So what I'm saying is, if possible, landscape orientation is preferred for submitting images to the calendar. Any uh, portrait orientation is great for other things, but not so good for the calendar. Now, I think I've also talked about aspect ratio. This refers to the ratio of the width of the image to its height. You may know that our calendar is 11 inches wide and eight and a half inches tall. That works out to an aspect ratio of 1.29 to one. Doesn't mean much to you, maybe, I don't know. But if we look at a couple of kind of photographic standards, an eight by 10 picture is 1.25 to one. And you can see on the right hand edge of this image that there's a little space that would either I would have a couple of solutions here. I could stretch the image out, which is okay. Um, I could fill that space with white or fill it with black or put the image in the middle and have white and black or white or black strips down the side. Eight by 10 is not too bad, but if I start to get smaller, like another standard photo size is four by six. You see there's more gap between the, the standard photo, uh, which is an aspect ratio of 1.5 and the background paper. A lot of people have monitors that are 16 by nine. And this aspect ratio is 1.77 to one. Now, again, I could stretch it. Uh, if I stretch this pin image vertically, you would turn your sombrero galaxy into a fedora galaxy or something like that because it would just be stacked up. The closer, the thing is, the closer or the farther you are away from that 
1.29 aspect ratio, the more the image will deviate from what you originally send me. And I, I really want to try and get the images as close to what you send me as possible so that your work is presented uh, and that's what's featured in the calendar. Resolution. The thing that we're looking for here is if at all possible, 300 pixels per inch. Um, at a minimum, I need 150. Now there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, the printer, the actual physical machine that makes our calendar prints at 300 pixels per inch, regardless of the size of the original image. What this means is any lower resolution images are upscaled. So they can be become blocky looking. And this is compounded by the fact that paper has a much higher resolution than any monitor or device. So when you see it on paper, that blockiness will become more visible. The reason that it, resolution is, I, I, I pointed out, is because the average monitor or, or on a laptop or a computer has a resolution between 70 and 100 PPI. Did someone have a question? Okay. Um, as a result, images on your screen can look great, but they end up being blocky looking on paper or even fuzzy. So here's a little illustration. I've taken three inches of my screen and I'm gonna pretend it's one inch on paper. So if I were to print a 750 PPI image, it would look like this, which is, you know what it is, but it's obviously pixelated and it's not, um, it's it's not a good representation of what your picture might be. If you send it at 150 PPI, much better. Um, this looks okay. When you can print this, we that that would be an okay image. But if you send it at 300 pixels, you can see that it ends up being much crisper, sharper, um, and it's. I know a lot of a lot of astronomers, a lot of astro images. Uh, take a great deal of time and care to make sure that their images are in focus and that there's no trailing and the, the, the edges are well-defined and things look sharp. So you ask the question, which way would you want your images presented? And that's really what we're doing with the calendar is presenting your image. Now, I may have mentioned something that's called color depth, and this is getting a little bit more technical, but what it really refers to is the number of colors that you can display, sorry, the number of different values of color that you can have in any one of the three or four uh, main color channels. So if you're using 8-bit color depth, which is the minimum, I, I, please send 8 bits. 8-bit uh, color depth gives you a, up to 256 different colors of red, 256 the six different colors of blue and green. In total, that works out to about 16 million different colors. Sounds like a ton, but my software, believe it or not, is intentionally, and it's old, uh, will work with up to 32 bits per channel, which is an awful lot of different colors. I think it's, well, in one channel at 32 bits, it works out to about 4 trillion different colors, and you have to multiply that by 4 trillion again, and the 4 trillion again, humongous number of colors. Anything between 12 to 16 bits per channel is a happy medium. And this is something that most DSLRs do relatively easily. Uh, so if you're setting your camera up to pack, uh, capture an image, just check to make sure that you're capturing 16 or anywhere between 12 and 16 bits of raw data. And that will be passed on in the image that you, that you generate. I'm not sure what uh, Astro, dedicated Astro cameras will take, um, but if you, can, if you can change the bits per channel, please make sure that it's at least eight. Now, one thing that people get confused about is color. Uh, and believe me, color is a, it's not quite rocket science, but it's not simple. Um, the term color space refers to a set of standardized tools that translate the reproduction capabilities of one device into the, re the capabilities of a different device. Now, if you spend a few seconds, we'll spend a few seconds thinking about the production stream for a digital image. The first device is the camera that you take to look at that or to capture that image with. The second device is the monitor that you display that image with. The third device are your eyes when you're looking at that monitor. The fourth device 
Yeah, I'm up to four. Uh, the fourth device is my monitor. I'm looking at it, and my eyes are the fifth device. And then the printer that goes, uh, it's printed on at the, uh, the calendar place, is six devices. And they all have to have a way of knowing what color you intend. So that's what color space partly refers to. And it's a kind of a complicated thing. But what I'm asking is if you have the opportunity, um, please send your your photographs or capture it's even more important capture your photographs in adobe rgb or Pho pro photo rgb now what these are are color spaces they're additive color spaces that have a really wide color gamut now that means that they can display lots of different colors and if you can send me adobe rgb or pro photo rgb i can do a good job of matching what i see on my screen to what you have on your screen it's preferred over srgb if possible and as i mentioned if you can capture your images using Adobe RGB or Profoto, that's great. Um, sRGB, which is what you see on your computer monitor at home typically, uh, it's an, also an added color space, but it's a got much more restricted color gamut. It means it displays a, a smaller range of, of colors. Um, it's acceptable, but it means that in all likelihood, the what you see on your screen will not be faithfully reproduced when we print onto paper. Be, that's because the printer uses a color space called CMYK. Uh, and this is a subtractive color space and that's subtractive because they're taking uh, light away when, the, when you're trying to see this image. Um, and it's a relatively small gamut, but the problem is that the CMYK and the sRGB are they have areas where there are gaps. So imagine that this is all of the possible colors that you can, you can reproduce. I have taken away the luminance, so you don't have to worry about whether or not it's light or dark or whatever. Um, this is the CMYK color space. Now, I, again, this is an abstraction. CMYK color covers more than these colors that you can see, but it doesn't cover all of them. And if you were to superimpose the sRGB color space onto the CMYK, as I've done here with the black lines, that's the black lines are sRGB. That doesn't do all of the CMYK, and it doesn't do all of the... Uh, there, there are some colors in CMYK that sRGB can't produce, and there are some colors in sRGB that CMYK can't produce. So to avoid that, I'm asking if possible, now it's not possible all the time, I know that, to send Adobe RGB. Now, Adobe RGB will has, has a wider color gamut, so it includes everything that's possible in sRGB plus other stuff. And it just happens to perfectly capture a CMYK as well. So we get it all in there. If you can use uh, Adobe RGB, you can get all the colors that you can see on your camera and all the colors that you can see on your monitor. If you are using a more sophisticated camera, Profoto RGB has an even bigger color space than Adobe RGB. So that's why I would suggest that you use that instead. Don't worry if we're coming to the end, it's almost done. <laughs> the overall dimensions of a full page. So this is if you want to get your image on the front cover. Uh, you need to send me a photo that has uh, at least 3,375 pixels across. Um, and at a minimum, 1,678 pixels. The, both of these are relatively easy to come up with. It's an 11 inch wide paper, and I have to add an eighth of an inch on each side for the printer in case they don't line the paper up properly. And then you just multiply it by the 300. So that's how we get a 3375. The height works out the same way. Um, maximum, like the best height possible, if you can send it, is 2,625 pixels. And the minimum height, this again for the front cover, so it's for a full page, will be 13 uh, or 1,313. Now, if you're looking to get your photo on the gallery page at the back, where we take the main page and divide it up into four sections, basically the height and width is divided in half. But you don't add two eighths because you only have one side. So the, the best size for a gallery page, if you want the best printing, it would be uh, 1,687 with a minimum size of 844 pixels. Now the maximum height works out the same way. Maximum height or best height, I should say, it's not really maximum, is 1312 and the minimum, the, the, these really are minimums, is 656. So the acceptable size range is anything that's more than 844 pixels wide, 
and more than 656 pixels tall. But be aware that the target dimensions, the image dimensions, will impact the placement of your image in the calendar. If you're significantly below the moon for the full scale, you're not going to, I'm not going to be able to print your image on one of the pages. Now, I believe that's it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to hear. Wow. And if you don't, that's too. <laughs> well, that's a fair amount of information there, Doug. Uh, I know that I'm going to be reviewing that when uh, I get a chance to, uh, to, to watch the replays. Um, it's quite a bit of information. Uh, let's see, do we have any other information or any other que any questions for you at all? Uh, I have a question for him. Certainly. Um, Doug, if I'm not really sure about some of these things that you talked about, are mm -hmm. you available to answer questions should I need to ask? Absolutely. Yeah. And but could we could we post this presentation on the website so that it's easily accessible for people to go back and review? Um, I'll be able to do yeah. that. Okay. What do you need, Chris? Uh, I've got it. I'm recording on my computer, so I just need to uh, edit that portion out, and I'll uh, post it on the website, probably under resources. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. That's that's excellent. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you all so very, very much, Doug. And, of course, thank you so, for all the work you do with the, uh, with the uh, calendar. Look forward, no problem. Look forward to the next edition. Okay, so family Whitman, Melissa. Oh, there you are. Hey, hi there. How are you? Ready and waiting. Waiting ready, and ready. Really. Okay. Well, um, we have three books tonight. There are three giveaways. Uh, let's always try to. Do. We lost Bernie. <laughs> hmm. Well then. We'll give him a second and see if he comes back. And if he doesn't, then we will go ahead with the draw and he can speak to the books afterwards. Does that make sense, Melissa? Sounds yep. great. Maya, okay. All right. Hit it, kiddo. All right then. Uh, so for our first winner, we have Mary Beer. There she is. Awesome. Yay. You don't know what you're winning, but you won something. <laughs> All good. <laughs> Thank you. Mary, the best thing is to um, email uh, Bernie at chair at amateurastronomy.org and arrange that with him. All right, Whitman's, what's up next? Uh, next, we have Al Murphy. Is Al Murphy with us? Let me check. I don't think so. I don't think so. That's no. Okay. Okay. All, right. All right. Well, well next we have Leslie. Leslie here. Is Leslie with us there, Bird? Yes, yes. Leslie here. Okay. Les is here, I think. Hi. Hey, Hi. there you are, bud. Hi. Hiding in the background. Okay. So, Les, just uh, email Bernie and let him know that you are um, a um, door prize winner tonight. Thank you. Thank you, guys. No problem. <laughs> uh, and next we have. Um, I'm sorry if I pronounced this wrong. Um, Yvonne, that's it. Hello. Hey. Hi. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. And as I said, Yvonne, just 
email Bernie at share at amateurastronomy.org and let him know that you're one of tonight's three door prize winners. I'll do that. Thank you. And it'll be something good. Great. <laughs> All right. Congratulations um, to everybody. Good night. Thank you, family Whitman and Maya and Melissa. And it doesn't look like Bernie's back. So Matthew, are you ready to go? I'm still here. Yep. All right. Let's go. You're so, up. Uh, hopefully everybody sticks around. The second half talks about donuts, so it'll be a bit different. Let's see here. What we got? Share screen. Panel, is it? There we go. I'm getting there. Okay, let's give this a go. Welcome to the sky this month for May of 22. Uh, this month, I'm really going to talk about a bunch of things that either happened or that I've seen in the news. Next month, I'm going to do the sky for the summer. So that'll be early June, I'll be covering the sky for the summer. Uh, that'll be my main part of the talk. Anyways, back at uh, the end of April, all those morning planets were in a nice alignment and uh, Jupiter and Venus were only about half a degree apart in the morning sky. Now Stellaria makes it look like they're touching, but they were obviously separate. When you actually saw them, we got up about 4.30 on the 30th and we went out and we observed by about 5 a.m. and took managed to get some pictures before the dawn twilight wiped out the sky. So that's a picture I got from just outside Brantford. Got Jupiter and Venus there and Mars there and Saturn up there. And what's really kind of interesting that has nothing to do with that, I'm gonna go back Aquarius is one of those constellations that I find really difficult to actually map out with my eyes uh, when I'm looking for it, especially, you know, later in the summer uh, is when I see it. It's next to Capricorn, but it, as you can see, there's not very many bright stars. They're all like magnitude four, three, whatever. They're not very bright. There's one thing you can always count on is this little piece right here. And I call it the Chaise Lounge or the you know, the, the zero grab chair, your, your recliner, whatever way you want to think of it, that part is really visually obvious in the sky and it allows you to give a starting point to find the rest of the constellation. And if you look up, there's Mars, if you look up above, there's actually the recliner right there and it will lead to other stars in the constellation. So that's just an observing tip for later in the summer because even in a dark sky, some of these constellations are not very bright. And in fact, the darker it is, the more stars there are, it gets actually harder to see than it was before. Uh, back about a month ago, John Gofro sent me this awesome picture that he took with his 130 millimeter refractor. And what he did was he held his cell phone up to the eyepiece and took this picture. And it's just beautiful. And I imagine he ran it through a little bit of uh, Photo processing, but uh, to get that amount of detail and, and get that kind of clarity and, and uh, contrast, there has to be really good bones to the picture to do that. So really a stunning picture. If I blew up the center part of it, just to talk about quickly about a few of the things there that you can look up on your map of the moon. So just to the north is this big area here is Mari Imbrium, Sea of Rains. Here is the Carpathian Mountains. Now, what's interesting about a lot of the mountain ranges on the moon, that they're actually the rim of impacts on the moon. And, what, and these uh, Mari, like Imbrium, are really big. So you can actually sort of draw a circle around the edge, and you'll see all these mountain ranges. And really, it's, you know, what happens when a conch and rock hits the moon and makes a big hole. You end up with all these mountain ridges around the edges, and that's what you see. Uh, this area here, right by this crater, Aristosthenes, it's called the Bay of Heat. And when I saw this, the next thing I saw was Mari Insularum. And I'm thinking, oh, they insulated the Bay of Heat. Of course, that wasn't right. 
it's the sea of islands because those are you know isolated i guess and that's way down over here the crater copernicus is one of the standout craters on the moon with its great eject blanket around of it and all the impacts from the ejecta raining back down on the moon and eratosthenes here is one of my favorites because it's one of the first craters that i learned to recognize when i was a little kid and when the apennine mountains over here this image is actually right to left because in a refractor, it does turn the image from right to left. As a few people have already mentioned, the, the lunar eclipse is coming. This is in the event horizon, these slides, and I'm not gonna waste a lot of time on it. Hopefully we're gonna get a glimpse. The weather report is now better for Sunday night than it was, but it's still not really what I would call awesome. So just have to get your stuff out and your chair and sit back and hope. So anyways, uh, first contact with the umbra, which is Earth's the dark part of Earth's shadow in here, is about 1030. That's when the shadow will start to take little beats out of the moon. By 1130, the moon will be totally uh, within the, the umbra of the Earth. And it should be quite a nice dark orangey red, really dark, because that volcano on the island of Tonga blew up early this year. And Apparently they, they released some information saying that the explosion was larger than the one that Krakatoa went through in the late uh, 19th century. So there's an awful lot of, it's a dirt up in the upper atmosphere that are, you know, working to change and refract uh, some of the wavelengths and leave us with this dark red color. So it should be really quite spooky if we get to see it. By 10 after 12-ish, the moon will be at its, uh, closest point to the center of the umbra. So the, this is the moment of greatest eclipse. And five to one, it will be starting to emerge from the umbra into the penumbra here, which is the sort of the outer edges of the Earth's shadow. And they're very light. So when the moon is in the penumbra, it's very difficult to see it as being any dimmer than when it's just outside completely. So really, the time you want to be looking at it is when it's in the umbra. So the whole thing is all over by 2 a.m. So it just depends on how the weather is and how long you can keep your eyes open. The James Webb, yay! It's actually almost ready to go. They're running calibrations now on all the cameras. Uh, they actually calibrate the cameras versus the, the uh, mirror segments and try to see if there's any distortion where they actually have known locations of stars in the image, I mean, exactly to probably the milli arc second. And then they check to make sure the stars are where they're supposed to be. And if they're not, if they're off by a tiny bit, they actually will and use the computer to correct any images they get to get everything head on. Now, Spitzer, which is one of the great space telescopes of all time, this is what the uh, part of the larger Magellanic cloud looked like. And this is what it looks like with Webb. And the difference to me is really quite stunning. You get much greater resolution because the mirror on the web is much bigger. And look at all this dust and gas and stuff here. Look at the detail in it compared to this. And this at the time was awesome, but this is really awesome. So I'm really looking forward to it going completely live. That'll be, I believe, July. And then we should see some absolutely stunning images. And you can bet they're going to put some out right away because you know, that's how you advertise yourself and get funding. So there could be some awesome images coming. Now, some of you may have heard of this. There's a company in the States called Spin Launch. I had never heard of it till the other day when I read an article on CNN and thought, this is really crazy. Like, who's gonna do this? Well, I've done it. This company has created a centrifuge and, and this is the uh, test version of it. And what they do is they have an arm in there and they spin up the arm really, really fast. And on the end of the arm is a missile, which contains a um, rocket and a um, instrument package to be delivered to space. And when it's spinning fast enough, it shoots it up this tube and right out up into the air. So I had to actually watch the video to see it actually demonstrated. They did a, a, a test, a proper test, just a couple of weeks ago, I guess. And um, they're ready to continue with their tests and actually scale it up. So here's what it looks like in a diagram. This is a huge vacuum chamber. The full size one is gonna be 330 feet across or hundred meters. 
this is a carbon fiber tether. It's a solid tether with a counterweight at one end and it starts spinning around and around and around. And at the end, there's like a, a claw that's holding a missile, which is like a sabot, if you know anything about rounds that artillery fires, it's like a sabot. It's like a protective shell that encases your actual payload protected until it's way up into the sky. So the vacuum chamber takes about an hour to pump down. It takes about one and a half hours to, to get this thing spinning full rate. And on the full size model, when it releases the, um, the missile, it'll be a one millisecond launch window. If they miss, you'd have a missile bouncing around in here. I don't think it would be good. So there's a one millisecond launch window. It spits it out here at about 5,000 kilometers per hour, Mach six or seven. So because this is a, a, a vacuum chamber, they have an actual um, uh, like a seal on the top of the, of the um, barrel. And the missile literally pokes a hole through it and keeps going. While the missile's going up the barrel, there are a series of airlocks that shut right behind it as it goes by. And that's to try and preserve as much of the uh, vacuum as it can. So it takes long, uh, less time to um, pump back down. And of course, between launches, they have to put a new top on the barrel to seal it so they can uh, open up those airlocks again and have a direct open barrel from, from the chamber out. So this is pretty wild. I mean, I'd never heard of it. Um, I thought people might be interested. Spin Launch has a website. You can watch some videos. What I did was they, I didn't want you to watch a three and a half, four minute video. So I held my phone up, my laptop, and I took a video on my phone and then I sent it by email back to my laptop. And here's the 16 seconds that counts. It's gonna show the um, other spinning in the centrifuge. It's gonna show the missile going out the tube or the barrel. It'll show the sabot releasing higher up in the atmosphere and the rocket engine um, uh, turning on and taking the payload up to space. That's it. That was the part that was critical from, from that um, whole three minute video. But if you get a chance, look it up. It's really quite interesting technically and imaginative. I don't know whether they will really succeed, but they have funding and they're, they're going for it. Now, our star, the sun, has been very, very busy the last few weeks. We're approaching solar maximum, but it's still not for another oh year or two yet. It's already getting really busy. Um, the last few weeks, like I said, have been really amazing. And we've already had a couple of X-class flares over the last few weeks. This one is a video a fellow by the name of Miguel took in Portugal of the after effects of an X-class flare back on April 30th. And the actual um, sunspot is actually just rotating off the far side of the uh, sun going to the far side. He was able to capture the Last of material coming back down to the sun as it uh, the, didn't escape, you know, as part of the part of the CME, it came back down. But look at the detail in this; it's stunning. And he's an amateur. A few days later, we had a day where there were ten filaments of, uh, visible on the face of the sun, a couple of sunspot groups, but ten filaments. It was crazy. The longest one was almost four hundred thousand kilometers. And that is basically the distance from the Earth to the Moon. Like these, these structures are immense. And these are the filaments, the dark ones here. They were everywhere, it seemed. And a filament is when you see um when you see the um oh what do you call them? Not the flare, prominences on the edge of the sun, like those bits that are jumping up, or darks and stuff like that. What you're seeing here is the same thing, but from the top. So you're seeing the top of the arc. And if you've got the right kind of telescope and there's an arch near the edge, you can actually see that from the bottom all the way to the top. It's really quite amazing. Anyways, 10 filaments, sunspots were crackling. There was one uh, sunspot a few days ago. It had um, something like 12 explosions in a 24-hour period. It was just going nuts. 
So here's the most recent X-class flare right in the middle there. And there's a C-class flare going over here. And you can actually see these huge magnetic lines of plasma that are occurring around that sunspot. I mean, it was nasty, but it was also really interesting to see. So like I always say, if you've got solar equipment, use it. This is the time to be getting it out. If you can't do it safely, there's all these kinds of resources online that let you see how magnificent the surface of the sun is right now. And it's just going to get better for the next few years. And this, thank goodness, uh, yesterday they released the first ever image of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And this was really timely because that last slide I showed you was as far as I had gotten. I was out of ideas. And then this came up as like awesome. So we're going to talk about this image of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Now, it's not one telescope that takes this image. It's a whole series of telescopes scattered around the globe. And what happens is they pair them up along these lines, to get as long a line called a baseline as they can between telescopes. So effectively, if you've got a telescope there at Go Valletta and this one at Cerro, baseline is this length, and that is the effective diameter of the uh, mirror of the telescope. Now, what happens is, is they record data at both sites. Both sites have a, a a matched atomic clock. And then they take all that data, which is now all time stamped with the atomic clock numbers. And then they take the information and they basically superimpose it over each other so they can use the signal. And so as the Earth spins, you've got all these different combinations of telescopes that can take one observation right after the other. So all these things have an actual name. These This type of Astronomy is called very long baseline interferometry. Interferometry is a fancy way of saying you collect data on two different telescopes and combine it. Now here's the actual image. It was released yesterday. I'm sure quite a few of you have seen it. Pretty cool. It looks an awful lot like M87 star that we saw back in 2019. I still remember that day. Uh, a few of us were together judging at a, a science fair at a school in, in uh, Hamilton. So the center of our galaxy, visually for us, is in Sagittarius, which for us is a summer constellation. And this is somewhere down south because we never see, you know, Sagittarius is high in the sky. But the way to find it is if you know Sagittarius, the constellation, it's just off the tip of the, of the uh, spout is where the center of our galaxy is. Another thing you can look for is this dark uh, image here, which is called the dark horse. There's a head and the front legs and the body and the back legs, and it's just off the tail of the horse. That actually will lead you directly to Sagittarius, but halfway in between is where that point is. And I'll show you on a map from Stellarium. This is at a different angle, but basically it's the same thing. The head of the horse, the front legs, body, back legs. This represents Sagittarius A star, which is what they call our black hole. And here is Sagittarius, the constellation. And for those of you who didn't know it was called a teapot, well, look at that. There's a the handle. There's the um, top of the teapot. There's the spout and the body. It looks awesome. It's recognizable right away. You know, if you say look for the teapot, if it's up in the sky, you'll find it because it's so easy. But just off the spout here is the center of our galaxy. Now, back in 2019, they released that image of M87 star really fast. Uh, and the reason is they were able to do it is the computer software they were using at the time was able to take all the data and massage it and get viable image. The problem with our Sagittarius A star black hole is it is way smaller. It's way closer, obviously, but it's also way smaller and it's not chewing up the same amount of material as M87's black hole. So what happens is, is that basically when you take these images with a radio telescope, you're doing long exposures. And because the material at the event horizon around our black hole has a complete orbit around the event horizon in minutes compared to days or weeks from M87, you get all this blurred imaging. 
Well, they had to figure out how to deal with that. Well, that's what I just talked about. You know, gas is uh, east of weeks at M87, but minutes to go around ours. So really the image around our, our um, black hole was changing rapidly. And what they did was they came up with four data sets, which are shown down here. And this bar graph shows the relative amount of data for each of these data sets. And of course, the part that's colored is for this particular data set. And then the purple here is the next one, the next data set, the green. And then this, I think, is yellow down here. And you can see this is pretty mushy. I'm not sure how useful that data is in the first place. But then they take this other stuff, and this is where they had to design the software to do this. And they massage it, and they come up with an, uh, an average or a mean value for, for everything that represents, best represents what the black hole would look like. And, uh, and that's what they came up with. But it took years and, and literally hundreds of people working on this to come up with this. So the, the software must be extraordinarily complex to do that. Now, when you're dealing with any of these stories, and if you've read about this stuff online, there's lots of stuff about this, this uh, Sagittarius A star that um, they talked about yesterday. There's tons of information. And they gave a couple analogies to try and point out how difficult it is to do this. So compared it to capturing a photo of a grain of salt in New York City using a camera in Los Angeles. Think about that, you, your camera, if you could actually see New York City, instead of it being over the horizon, you'd be trying to take a picture of a grain of salt. The other analogy they gave was, if you could actually see it in our night sky, the black hole would appear to be the same size as a donut sitting on the moon. And this is the part that I read that really turned my crank and I thought I could do something with that. Donuts are great, <laughs> can do something with this. So just as an example, here's John's image again, just of Copernicus. And it has a diameter of 93 kilometers. And if you were to try and put donuts right next to each other, all the way across, string them together to go right across, it would take 1,162,500 Krispy Kreme donuts to do that. Pretty awesome. That's probably as many as all of Canada eats in a day, if you think about it, which is kind of also kind of disgusting. But hey. now from there, I thought, well, I should be able to calculate the resolution of the telescope in arc seconds using the donut analogy and get pretty close, which <laughs> most normal people wouldn't probably think about, but I did. Oh, so yeah. anyways, I decided that I would give it a go. And it really requires a couple of facts and a couple of assumptions, and none of them are unreasonable. So you need to know the visible circumference of the moon, the half we can see, which is 5,460 kilometers. You need to know the angular size of the moon in the sky, which is half a degree, which is 30 arc minutes. We're gonna assume that a donut diameter is eight centimeters. And I got that from Krispy Kreme on the internet. So I have to assume it's pretty correct, or at least they were donuts. And I assumed myself that the donut was to represent the equivalent of one pixel in a photograph, which is the smallest resolvable object in a telescope or in that telescope array. In other words, if it's smaller than one pixel, you'll never see it. But at least at one pixel, it's there. So this is sort of what I used as my starting point. And now some math. Not much though, thank goodness. Well, first we want to know the diameter of the moon in arc seconds, not in degrees, not in minutes. We need arc seconds. So what we're going to do is multiply the 30 arc minutes, which is the diameter of the moon in the sky, by 60 arc seconds per minute. And we end up that the moon is 1800 arc seconds across. Then we need to know how many donuts would be required to form a line all the way across the face of the, of the moon uh, from one side to the other around its circumference, assuming that the sphere is flat because I can't take all the mountains and the valleys and the craters and everything into consideration. That'd be just silly. Well, here we go. So. Because the donuts are eight centimeters, there's 12 and a half donuts per meter, which is D per M, donuts per meter, right? Thousand meters in a kilometer. So now you got 12,500 donuts in, per kilometer. And now we've got the circumference times the number of donuts per kilometer. And it turns out you need 68,250,000 donuts to go from one side to the other. And that's a lot of donuts. 
And from this, we can calculate the angular size of a donut sitting on the moon. And this should give us an indication of the resolution of the Event Horizon Telescope Array. Wow. So here we are, the moon is 1800 arc seconds across. We've got 68,250,000 donuts. We divide the arc seconds by the donuts and you get 0.000264 arc seconds per donut which is 26.4 micro arc seconds per donut or 26.4 millionths of an arc second. And that's really, really small. And that's where the huge baseline using basically the whole diameter of the earth comes in when you use these telescopes and gather the data. Otherwise we'd never be able to see something that tiny. And then I looked up what the actual resolution is, raw resolution of it, of that telescope is, and it's 25 micro arc seconds. So I was pretty, you know, jazz. I got this really close <laughs> based on a whole bunch of should be maybes. It ended up worked out. So it just goes to show donuts are not complete waste of space that seem to be, although I really like them. Now on the moon, there are actual craters called donut craters, which are usually uh, two craters, one inside the other that are perfectly symmetrical. So it looks like a donut. And you can actually look these up online and you can find a list of donut craters on the moon, some of which are observable with your backyard telescopes. This one is a crater. And my last slide is just there because I really like World War II fighters and this is a Hawker Hurricane, one of my favorites, and it's flying past the moon. This was done by a fellow in England in a field um, just a few weeks ago, I guess. He took this picture and if I could have been there, I would have took that picture too. So. That's the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I presume my uh, audio is working again. I see my video moving. Can you hear yep. me? Good. You're good. Thank You're you. good, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, turns out I had too many things plugged into the computer. And of course, it is Friday the 13th. So that's going to happen. Um, what did we miss? Oh yes, the uh, the door prizes. I know you uh, you did award them. I don't know who got what, but let me tell you what you are going to get. Let's see. One of the prizes is field guide to the stars and planets. This book uh, was has been around for many many years. It's Peterson Field Guide. I remember getting this in early high school, not this particular copy, but I use this as my reference book for astronomy. It's a great book. Um, our second prize is a whole a book, Hubble, the Mirror on the Universe, uh, with a whole whack of neat pictures, thing, pillars of creation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if that doesn't do it for you, our third prize, a little closer to home, is Orbit which is photographs of the earth taken from orbit. Lots and lots of great coffee book, or coffee table book. So those were the, the prizes that were given. Um, was there a, did I hear correct that there was a fourth prize given? Uh, no, no, Bernie, there wasn't a fourth. The three winners will contact you directly. Awesome. OK. Uh, <laughs> I guess I need just to give thanks to uh, to our speaker. I believe he has left us already. Yes, I, I saw a message that he had to go. He thanked us very much. Had a wonderful time, all that nice stuff. Thanks to Melissa and uh, Doug and uh, Matthew and everybody else involved tonight. Um, our next meeting is... I don't even have to look. It's Friday, June the 10th. Uh, same time, same place, different day, or different day of the month. Uh, we will see you then. Our speaker was supposed to be uh, Carrie Ann Lecky Hepburn giving us a tutorial on astrophotography. But at the time of our meeting, the only way that she could be uh, doing the presentation as if she was sitting in the airport lounge waiting for a flight to Chile. So she has uh, informed me of that and she was willing to try to do that, but I have contacted 
um, Dr. Paul Delaney, who will speak to us on that day about solar astronomy. I think that's rather timely considering the period of the solar cycle that we're in and coming into the summer and all that good stuff. So he will be here next month. I will be here next month. I hope you will be here next month. If anybody have anything else before I turn you loose? Yes, go ahead. I, uh, I, I forgot to mention one thing about the donuts business. And that is, uh, that's from our perspective being about 26,000 light years from the black hole. If it was a Timbit with the same apparent diameter, we would be actually all the way out on the very edge of the Milky Way. And if you turned around in winter, there wouldn't be any Milky Way to see because we right out at the very edge and all you'd see is the local stars. And well, that, that, we would have that we would have taken the donut and dipped it in the milk in the Milky Way. So. Yeah, so if it was a tin bit, you know, our whole experience with astronomy would be quite different. Yes, it would. <laughs> <laughs> it would indeed. Well, that was the part I forgot. Sorry. Yes. Um, okay, anybody? Yeah, anybody? Anything? Yeah, next We're meeting ready. on the 10th of June. 10th of June, yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, Paul? Did anybody see the article in uh, the, um, oh, I forget the name of the thing. Anyways, nuclear powered rockets. The NASA and the military are developing them. I might have seen something along uh, that line that doesn't come that article. NASA actually has it on their website of nuclear powered rockets. Um, once the rocket escapes Earth's gravity, they, they believe they can use nuclear power and hydrogen to propel a rocket um, with twice the efficiency of solid columns, which would get them to Mars a whole lot quicker. Well, that's possible. That would be good. Uh, I don't know how they're going to convince the public that it's safe now to put uh, radioactive materials through our atmosphere to get them into space. Uh, it seems to me, I seem to recall that there's an international treaty banning radioactive materials in orbit and in space. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know how they're going to get around it's that. Very it's very good needle, I do it, but yeah. the, the governments tend to change the rules as they see fit, as they need. Mm -hmm. You know, placate the, the, the lemmings. Um, oh, did, did, was this a recent article that you're referring to? Because I yeah. know back in the late 60s and 70s, there was a, a proposal to uh, propel rockets by detonating nuclear bombs behind them uh, and putting the rocket on top of a big plate. Uh, they seriously looked at that for a while, but eventually decided it wasn't a good idea. So, but if it's more recent, then clearly it's not nuclear bombs they're talking about. Yeah, no, this was published uh, two days ago, actually. Oh, okay. Talk the mechanics, and there's uh, some good information at, on the NASA website on their, I don't know, it's their think tank of how they make things work in the future. So they figured, they figured out they can safely feed hydrogen gas through a nuclear reactor heat chamber, um, get it super hot and cause, use that expansion rate to propel it through the atmosphere through space with twice the efficiency of fuel than anything we have now. Cool. Cool. Plasma. Okay. So anyway, uh, let's, we can continue that conversation uh, if you like guys, uh, but I'm going to close off the meeting uh, for those of you who are waiting me to do so. Uh, we will see you next month. Be safe, play fair, and we'll see you soon. Okay, okay. Thank you. We can end the recording at any point. Guys, enjoy.